Okay, all set. Okay. So let's do the following. Um, let me, I will figure this out, but I'll, okay, so here's the plan. I will try and give you guys a five minute warning um, when you, so, so that everybody has 20 minutes, right? And so then I will give you a five minute warning and then, um, and a three minute warning. That sounds like a good plan. Okay. Okay. So, um, and then, and, and the, so I'll find two chimes so that this way, you know, the five minute warning sounds different than the three minute warning. Okay. So, um, let's get started. So welcome everyone to our spring 2021 uh, Robo MSC thesis presentation. So this is extremely exciting because um, for many of our presenters, right, this is the culmination of their Robo Masters um, program. And they have actually been working on this, uh, if not for this semester, uh, definitely, you know, for uh, you know, sometimes even longer. Um, and so it's a awesome um, you know, opportunity for us to be able to learn about all the uh, wonderful work uh, that they have been undertaking. Um, and so this is a, you know, I'm really looking forward uh, to this um, set of, of thesis uh, for the spring semester, especially given the fact that we have a very nice diverse set of themes. So without further ado, our first uh, presenter is Wei Yu Du. And she will be telling us about learning human affordance in the wild. So, Wei Du, uh, Wei Yu, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to my thesis presentation today. Um, the topic I'm going to talk about is learning human affordance in the wild. So, first of all, I would like to thank my uh, thesis advisor, Professor Shi, for his guidance, and my collaborator Ling Zhu, which made uh, who made heavy contribution to this project. Um, first of all, let's start off with the concept of affordance. Um, so, this term is actually from psychology, which is initially coined by um, psychologist James Gibson back in 1979. Um, the word refers to opportunities of interactions in a scene. For example, like a person sees a, a couch and he understands that uh, he can sit on it or lie down on it. Um, so it is a very fundamental skill for human beings. Uh, actually, according to Gibson, humans not only just perceive affordance, but they also um, actively change the environment in order to modify the affordance for their own use. Um, so in AI and robotics, this is an equally important skill for them to better understand and interact with the world. So in the field of computer vision, um, human affordance prediction refers to the task of predicting the plausible locations of humans and their likely poses given a tongue test image. For example, uh, in the corner illustration here, we see on the left is a background image with some people in it. And we want the network to learn uh, how other humans could possibly interact with the environment or with the people in the scene. For example, on the, uh, on the right, we see some examples like the person could be running or they could be interacting with this person here. Um, the biggest challenge of affordance learning tasks is actually the lack of large-scale, well-labeled data. Intuitively, it is just hard to manually label all the possible poses uh, of a person in a scene because there are just numerous of them. So previous research have found uh, many different ways to uh, around this issue. And one example is a work in uh, 2017 CVPR called binge watching scaling affordance learning from sitcoms. Essentially, they leverage sitcom TV shows, which include a set of specific indoor scenes and uh, some camera angles, but many different uh, videos of people interacting in those things. Like the right illustration is an example. We see like 
the living room scene is uh, basically set, but we have different frames of people interacting with the furniture in the living room in different ways. So what they did is that they extract post labels from uh, these different frames, and that would give them a diverse set of labels, which they learn uh, then use to train the networks. So this method has proved useful in many different ways. The one limitation it has is like the limited generalization abilities due to like less varied and diverse things. So if we imagine people every day interact with a various number of things, both indoors and outdoors. So the interaction type cannot be fully captured by just some uh, set things in a TV data set. So to this end, uh, we want to introduce a framework called Impain to Learn. So this is um, essentially a task agnostic framework that allow us to generate ground truth labels for any data sets in the wild. Um, so the uh, basically the generation pipeline is shown in the diagram here. We start off with an original image with a person, and then we first use Mars RCN network to uh, basically predict a mass of the person of interest. Then we use this mass and cut the person out and use this uh, image in painting technique called profile to fill the image, um, fill the background essentially. And we will have this in painted image. Then we could use this uh, and run a bunch of off the shell networks such as depth estimation or segmentation um, just to generate auxiliary information we will use in later training. And finally, to obtain uh, post labels, we just run a 2D post detector alpha post on the original image, and this will give us the post shown here. Uh, we, in order to have high quality data, we also need to pre-screen our uh, post labels in many different ways. So these are the four, four rules we use listed here. Uh, essentially, we don't want the image to have too many people in there and the person detected should not be either too small or too large and uh, not, not very occluded by the environment. So uh, now let's get to the overview of our prediction pipeline. So we have followed previous works in designing a two-stage um, pipeline, including the where stage, that is the human bounty box prediction, and the what stage, which is the human post prediction. So I will dive into them one by one next. Uh, in predicting human bounding boxes, uh, essentially our main model is the conditional VE that would encode um, the bounding box into a latent space. And the, uh, like that is the encoder shown here on, in the corner. And then uh, like another decoder that takes conditional information, which is RGB image, semantic segmentation map, and depth map and also a tiled latent embedding, uh, which has the same dimension spatially as the other uh, images. One thing to note here is that we actually uh, do not use like the uh, four coordinates for bounding box representation. Instead, we parameterize them as a fine transformation matrices shown here. Uh, so we only have four parameters in this affine matrix. So essentially what we do is that we have a canonical white mass uh, as shown in the right corner here, and we will use the affine matrix uh, predicted or the ground truth ones to warp this canonical mass into a bounding box mask, which is used in uh, later stages. So uh, the reason we chose this uh, representation is we want a spatially aligned representation of the bounding box uh, without cutting off the gradients. So following the conditional V uh, loss formulation, we write our loss in this form, which is essentially just two terms. The first term is a KL divergence that ensures the latent space looks like a Gaussian ball. And the second term is the reconstruction, which basically guarantees there's a one-to-one -one mapping between latent space and the output state space. 
Um, so essentially, we have covered uh, this left part of the diagram here up to the bounding box generator, which is the decoder in the conditional VE model we talked about. Uh, so the output of this generator is a affine matrix transformation parameter. Um, so we then use a spatial transformer network to uh, warp this canonical mass uh, into this binary mask here, shown on the right corner. Uh, essentially here, um, in, in order to encourage more diversity uh, in the predictions, we do not simply just supervise um, the prediction with the ground truth label. Instead, we add a bounding box discriminator um, that takes in uh, all the information, the RGB image, segmentation, and depth, and also this either predicted or ground truth mask, and um, use them as fake or real examples for the discriminator. So the adversarial training laws as defined here, essentially we are just encouraging the networks to predict real for real examples and fake for fake examples. So our overall training objective is simply combining the three terms, the first KL divergence and reconstruction terms from the conditional VE model and the adversarial training uh, term for the discriminator. Um, the next stage is uh, synthesizing the human post given uh, the location, basically the bounding box mass we have predicted in the previous stage. So this stage here shown like in the diagram here is actually very similar to our uh, previous stage. We also use a conditional VE that embeds to the human joint locations and um, the decoder would take in essentially the same information as before, plus the bounding box, bounding box mass we predicted. Uh, the only difference here is that um, instead of using an STN, we use a pre-trained heat map decoder that would render the post joints locations into post heat maps. So it is shown here. The post coordinates are simply a vector, um, but we want a spatially aligned um, output. So that's why we render the post out in the image form. Another thing we noticed in our experiments is that directly regressing um, the post coordinates could be difficult for the network. That's why we first use a post VE to embed a uh, all the possible coordinates into a latent space of dimension 16. So in prediction, we are actually predicting the latent codes from the pre-trained post BE instead of the coordinates. Uh, the overall objective is again, very similar to before, uh, two terms for the conditional VE and one terms for the adverse, adverse or training, um, essentially the discriminator here. Um, now I want to talk about um, the data set we used, which is the MPI data set. Uh, so this is an overview um, of what's in there. Essentially, there is a diverse set of uh, humans doing different things in different scenarios. And after we run the in pain to learn pipeline and also uh, the pre-screening, pre we end up with uh, nearly 20,000 training data points and 1,000 testing data points. So this is a fairly large um, data set to work on. Uh, next, we, next, we are gonna show some experimental results. So first uh, we just have a sanity check over our pre-trained networks. This is some uh, visualizations. Uh, this diagram on the left is the results from the heat map decoder. Essentially, the left is the predicted heat map and the right is the ground truth heat map. We could see like it has a fairly good um, rendering quality. And the rest uh, on the right, this is like a, a 100 sample from uh, Gaussian 01 in the latent space of the pre-trained post VE, we see like a set of plausible and diverse poses. And in the left corner, this is a reconstruction visualization of the VE. So just to see the network is working well. 
So next we're going to show some of our um, results for human affordance prediction um, qualitatively. So in the first two rows, we are showing um, some bounding box predictions on uh, the background images. So we can see that there is a diverse uh, set of sizes and locations, and uh, they all make sense. And one thing to know that um, they actually, uh, if we observe, we can see that the bounding box, which are further away from the camera, appear to be smaller. And this uh, is actually um, like a base, the rule of 3D geometry. And in the bottom two rows are some visualization of uh, the human poses we have synthesized. We can see like there is uh, a, a lot of interactions with the environment and also interactions with the people in the environment, such as here, like this person seems to be talking to the little boy here. Um, next, we want to show some quantitative results um, what we did is that we uh, used Amazon Mechanical Turk um, to conduct a user study uh, over 50 testing images. And we asked the worker if um, the machine generated results seem plausible. And here are their scores. Uh, the first column is bounding box score. Uh, we're sh just showing like the first two rows from here. And the second column is post score. Uh, so here we are doing an ablation study of uh, different kinds of input to the network. Um, essentially, we start off with uh, a model that only takes in RGB image and adds that segmentation, and finally our full model. We can see here that our full model has the highest score in terms of user study. And um, the third column here, diversity, uh, is computed by averaging pairwise distance between 10 sample predictions across 1,000 testing images. So here we're showing that our full model is actually able to generate more plausible results without damaging the diversity quality. Uh, here is um, a visualized view uh, comparison of our RGB only models and our full models. Uh, we can see here that the full model can produce much more diverse uh, bounding boxes in terms of shape and size. And they are actually more aligned with the geometry of the scene. Um, here we are showing more uh, generated results from our bounding box prediction stage. And uh, here is more results from uh, post synthesis. Uh, in conclusion, in this work, we proposed a framework called Intent to Learn which is a task agnostic framework that can generate ground truth affordance labels from images in the wild. Um, so the exact network pipeline we proposed is a two-stage predictor, uh, which first predict where the human bounding box prediction and then what the posting does. And we also use a new semantics and geometry uh, aware um, adversarial learning strategy, which refers to our discriminator, which has access to depth and segmentation information. We have shown in our experiments that uh, proposed models are able to generate diverse and visually plausible predictions. And we plan to release the data set with uh, all the affordance labels we have generated in the near future. Um, finally, as future work, we are working to expand human affordance learning to the video domain. So instead of just showing a static person in an environment, we are uh, hoping to uh, create motion that are um, sensible to the interactions of the environment. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to open the floor up to questions. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself or type your questions into the chat.
so we do. I have a question. Um, so some of these, you know, so what are situations that so you showed some really cool results? Um, but what are it seems that, you know, a lot of oftentimes uh, the humans seem to be somewhat spaced apart. Um, so is there a condition, right, that where it um, makes it harder uh, for you to be able to generate or, or identify these, these affordances, sort of, you know, cer certain types of images? Uh, do refers to like the uh, affordance label generation or the prediction stage? Uh, both actually. Oh yeah, so uh, for uh, the label generation, like um, we have used these uh, four criteria to uh, basically select out the images that would prove hard to generate. Essentially, like um, if you have too many people in the image, then you would not have a very, so everyone is small and you would not have a very accurate post detection results. And also if your body is heavily occluded or like basically the image is zoomed into a certain part of the body, it may be very hard for uh, image in painting techniques. So in the example here, we can still see some artifacts like the person's head is not um, like completely eliminated. So if let's say the person takes a larger part of the image, like it would be harder to generate the labels. And for the uh, like actual prediction, um, we have found that um, like despite the good results show here, there is some difficulty uh, for the uh, network to synthesize very different poses. And um, actually we have included like uh, half body poses in our um, training data set, but they don't look very reasonable um, in actual predictions. So that's, um, but the bounding box location uh, looks very diverse and that's actually what gives us most diversity. Yeah. Great, thank you. Do we have other questions? Okay, so given the fact you actually this is perfect because we're ending right on time. So thank you, Wei Yu. And um, let's go ahead and uh, have our next speaker, which is uh, Jia Ming, set up. So go ahead and share your screen whenever you're ready. And in the meantime, we'll thank Ryu again for her presentation. Okay, perfect. So our next speaker is Jia Ming, and he will be telling us about exemplar-based instance super resolution, or EISR. Take it away. Thank you. So. Hello everyone. Today I'm going to present my master thesis. The name is Exemplar Based Instance Super Resolution. I would first like to thank my advisor, Professor Jian Bo Shi, for his support. And I thank uh, Lin Zhi and Jian Cong. We have a lovely time discussed together. So from this title, it's obvious that this whole framework is consists of two main parts. First, uh, instance. Uh, means we leverage instance level information in super resolution task. And second, we find way to match similar neural features and directly borrow them from high resolution reference, so-called exemplar based. And this whole framework could be applied in most mainstream uh, super resolution architecture designs. So here is the outline of today's presentation. There are three modules and I will explain each of them in the following slides and show both quantitative and qualitative results at the end of today's presentation. Uh, and feel free to stop me anytime. So first, let us take a look at the overall system diagram. In this paper, we use an encoder, a decoder kind of super resolution architecture at the backbone. As you can see, 
the input is a low resolution image. Uh, the target is a uh, upsampled uh, super resolution image. A pre-trained uh, detector will detect all instances uh, and both a uh, full image and segmented instances are fed into uh, the encoder, produce intermediate uh, neural results. The fusion module will take care of uh, the two inputs and, uh, and produce a fuse feature. I will explain the fusion module in the next slides. Uh, and meanwhile, we try to uh, retrieve similar reference in the data set for every single instance here uh, and send them to uh, a future ex extractor. Here we, here we use a pre-trained VGG. Um, I will explain how exemplar swapper works in a multi-level fashion. So as a result, the exemplar swapper will produce a swapped feature map M for each scale. And the texture transfer module will uh, take advantages of this additional learn feature. I will explain detail about tech, uh, texture transfer module in, the, in section three. Okay, so given the full image feature Z, ZG and a bunch of instance features ZXI and their bounding box location BXI, we first predict the corresponding weight map through a small neural network with three convolution layers. And based on detect locations, both instance feature and weight map are resized zero padded to match the original size and location in the full image. The final fuse feature ZF is computed using uh, the weighted sum of features as shown in equation here. And next module is feature swapper. Swappers, feature swapper is applied in a multi-level fashion, low level texture and the high level semantic similarity are simultaneously considered in exemplar swappers. A pre-trained VGG network extract multi-level uh, features of low resolution instance and reference instance. In the feature space, the similarity between the ICE low resolution reference point, uh, feature point and the J's reference feature point could be calculated uh, use an inner product. Instead of pixel-wise multiplication, correlation operation concurrently calculate the J similarity map uh, SJ here, which indicate the similarity value between the J's uh, feature, uh, reference feature point and the entire uh, low resolution feature space, the orange one. So S is a stack of similar, sim similarity maps one similarity maps per pixel in the reference feature space. After that, we use argmac function to find the maximum similar, the similarity map value over all similarity maps at location xy to be the value of mxy, the output. So intuitively, we search similar feature in the uh, reference feature space and replace the original feature, produce additional swap feature map M in each scale. So once we get a swap feature map M to merge multi-level swap feature map MI with a neural features a zeta from previous layer, we deploy this texture transfer module at each feature layer in the SR decoder. The texture transfer has two branches as shown in the figure. There are two inputs. The feature maps a zeta from previous upsampling layer and the swap feature map M from the feature swapper module. The second branch 
channel-wise concave two feature maps and pass through a residual blocks. Two branches add up before next upsampling layer, merging content information together. The whole texture transfer module is defined in equation here. So after explaining all this, um, all three modules, let's go back to the overall system diagram. I believe it's more clear now. The whole system consists of two parts, uh, the fusion part here and the reference part here. Training this whole system with additional module, we get more realistic results. Uh, so now let me show you some results in the next few slides. So we evaluate this method with three indicators, PSNR, SSIM, and LPIPS. PSNR, peak signal to noise ratio, is the ratio between the maximum possible power of a signal and the power of noise. A higher PSNR indicates better synthesis quality. SSIM is another traditional indicator in super resolution task. A higher SSIM value indicate better synthesis quality as well. The wide used PSNR SSIM indicators occasionally give a conclusion contrary to human perception when judging perceptual similarity of pictures. In contrast, the perceptual similarity measurement based on learning uh, is more aligned with human perception. So our uh, experiment calculate LPIPS based on a pre-trained AlexNet and evaluate the distance between ground truth image and SR output. So as, as you can see in this table, our method outperforms the baseline method and the, uh, the instance uh, uh, method uh, in all three indicators. So besides, here are some uh, quantitative and qualitative, uh, besides here are some qualitative results compared to the baseline method. The baseline method is the basic super resolution backbone without any additional modules. As you can see here, the proposed method um, has a better synthesis quality, uh, focusing more on instance uh, discrepancy while uh, maintaining a global consistent consistency. And here are more examples. So once we zoom in a random object in the super resolution result, it's more clear that our framework produce more realistic instance with more details compared to uh, the baseline method. So to sum up, we propose to adapt instance feature fusion and exemplar-based features swapping in the on the existing SR framework. Both quantitative and qualitative results are conducted to demonstrate the effectiveness and adaptiveness of this method. We believe this work takes the important step towards leveraging instance level feature in SR task, combining exemplar-based technique in a multi-level fashion. 
Um, thank you. Great, thank you. So again, I'm going to open the floor for questions. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself or simply uh, you know, type your questions into the chat. Do we have any questions? So I have a, I, I'm out of curiosity. Um, so you, it, you know, I think this is really cool. The work that you know, the the work that you're doing. Um, what I'm not sure about, right, is that as you're effectively, you know, making the images, um, effect, you know, sharper, is there any attempt at trying to, um, you know, check and see if the resulting um, images that you get, these sort of high resolution, the the information encoded in them is actually correct. Is it compared to some kind of a ground truth? And the reason why I was curious is because you know you show the the example of the car, right? Yes. And it was really neat to see how you were able to clean up, you know, get these details around the grill. Um, but say, for example, the license plate, um, you know, would you actually be able to get um the information yeah can you i mean you know this is kind of an interesting question here would you yes. be able to get the detail to that if you know have you thought about comparing it to ground truth i guess is what i'm asking <laughs> you mean uh, compared to the ground truth uh, feature space um well no just you know if you actually did this on a real image where you actually know you know for example the the actual um features on the on the image um, on the actual just you know, object, I guess, is another way to think about it. Yeah. Uh, uh, with, a true uh, object. <laughs> right. This is important, uh, like uh, interesting um, uh, direction that I didn't, I didn't uh, explore in this paper. Maybe I, uh, it could be put in our future work. I, I just thought that was an interesting um, I, I think it'll be really neat if you can somehow yeah, yes. you know, think about those kinds of comparisons as well. So, yeah, yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Okay. Um, so in we are a little bit ahead of time, but that's okay. Um, let's uh, go ahead. I'm going to Gia, if you're, yeah, so let's have our other speaker. So everyone thanks um, Gia again for his wonderful presentation. And then let's go ahead and ask uh, Shang Hao to um, get set up and have your, see if you can share your, 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 your slides. Thank you. Um share my screen um, yeah go ahead let me know if you have trouble with it yep okay yep. okay hold on i think i'm i think it might be there we go okay great x okay so let me uh if you wanna perfect okay so let me go ahead and introduce you so our next uh, speaker is Shen Haozhou, and he will be uh, telling us about his thesis, Image Synthesis with Latent Space Embedding. So whenever you're ready, uh, go ahead. Thanks. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Shen Haozhou. Um, um, my thesis is about the image synthesis with the latent space embedding. Uh, my advisor is uh, Professor Jim Bushi, and my uh, collaborator is uh, Ling Jun uh, Thanks uh, uh, to their uh, very uh, detailed um, uh, guidance and, and help. Um, so, um, so um, there, there gonna be three parts uh, in this um, presentation. Uh, first, we're gonna talk about um, uh, Stargate and its latent space. Then we'll move on to talk about algorithm to embed images into the latent space. And then we will talk about how we can uh, synthesize images with uh, these kinds of like embedding algorithms. So first, we're gonna talk about the style again. Uh, so 
Before we talk about style again, uh, maybe we're gonna, gonna uh, first uh, quickly uh, re review the architecture of again. So basically there are gonna be three patterns again. So first, uh, you know, you start off with a label called V and then you use the generator to uh, generate GZ, which uh, hopefully capture um, the data X. And there is a discriminator, which try to distinguish between the GZ that you generate and the real data X. And the uh, adversary competition between the generator and discriminators uh, um, help the uh, training. And then at the end of the day, uh, the ge generator is able to generate uh, really uh, uh, high quality uh, result that is uh, close to the data X. So style gain is uh, just a, a special kind of gain. So uh, the not novelty of style gain is that it use a brand new design for its generator. So the big things about the style gain is that uh, it can generate really high quality images. So as you can see uh, the image on the right, it, it can actually generate both uh, diverse and uh, high quality images. So that uh, made people wonder, uh, can we you know, actually make use of it? And uh, since it's new images, um, and then, um, yeah, so uh, as we can see uh, on the left, so the architecture of uh, style again, uh, still look li like again, it still has a latent space, uh, but it used an additional mapping network to map the or or original latent space C uh, to an intermediate latent space W. And then W, uh, it's fed into the jet generator. Uh, it repeats W 18 times for each scale level for the generator. The generator will generate an images uh, from low resolution to high re resolution. So um, it ha has uh, 18 uh, scale level. So um, the W is repeated 18 times for each scale level to generate the final images. So uh, what is the latent space of a style again? Uh, uh, we so there are uh, many choices. Of course, Z and W are valid choices, but we follow the convention of a previous work uh, and use uh, the so-called W plus space as its latent space. Basically, uh, we take this W space as a latent space, and we allow uh, that uh, to be a little different at each scale level. So now we have a, um, a larger latent space uh, that uh, has more expressive power. So um, uh, we did some experiment to explore the uh, structure of the latent space. So we find um, the magnitude of latent code actually matters. So uh, the la latent space are formed like an only-like structure. So um, at the center, uh, when it, uh, the latent code is all zero, uh, it looks like an average phase um, of the data set. And if we move further away, we can see the phase changes a little bit. And if we move further and further, we can see the phase changes. Um, and if we uh, move too far away, it stops uh, looks like a um, good looking phase anymore. And we also find, um, you know, closer to the center, there are more diversity. Um, uh, uh, so, sorry, uh, closer to the center, there are less diversity. Um, you know, uh, we just uh, sample uh, three uh, code uh, um, and decode out. We can see, you know, uh, when it's closer to the center, you know, the phases uh, still looks like that average phases. But if, if we move further away and we then post recode, when we decode out, we can see the phases looks um, very different. So, um, after talking about that, uh, next we're gonna talk about the embedding algorithms. So, um, some motivation for that is uh, some, actually we want to um, generate images with, with again. So, uh, if we want to do that, uh, all we have to do is just uh, throw away the discriminator and then just to use the generators. Uh, we can even simplify the diagram here. Uh, you know, we just start off from a latent code Z and we use the generator and we generate the image out. So if we simply just want to do some unconditional image synthesis, all we have to do is just sample a bunch of data code and decode that out, we get you know, many images. 
But however, uh, most likely we won't, won't gain some control over the images that we generate. For example, you have some condition you want, you know, uh, that uh, to generate images has a special pair of eyes. And then, you know, um, you cannot directly do that with uh, uh, that GAN directly. So one way to um, achieve this kind of a conditional image synthesis is uh, use some condition and some ad additional input. So you just uh, uh, through that condition as an input uh, to the net network, and then you reach the model. It works, but uh, somehow it's uh, painful because uh, first you have to collect the data, Time. Second, you have to retrain the module. And um, if you're using the GAN, uh, especially you know, you know, the powerful GAN module like a star GAN, uh, retrain is going to take a lot of time and consumes a lot, lot of GPU resources, which uh, uh, might not be available to most of uh, people. So, um, so uh, we like to avoid retrain that. And alternatively, uh, we can do that with the kind of uh, searching the latent space. So if there is an oracle there that can tell us, you know, given that condition which latent code to use, then we don't have to retrain the generator at all. We just use that um, good latent code and just decode it out. And then we get a good looking images that according to the condition that we get. So, um, so uh, the reason that we talk about the embedding algorithm is that uh, embedding algorithm, uh, it turns out, uh, it's actually an oracle that can do this for us. So, um, so uh, let's talk about the, the, the embedding itself. So what is embedding? Well, embedding is that given the uh, image X, we want to find its corresponding uh, latent code Z. So how can we solve this problem? Um, so um, one way to do that is um, um, formulate it as an optimization problem. So uh, it's a kind of simple. We just want to minimize the loss of the generated images and the real images. And we can see, you know, in this formulation, um, since the G itself is a differentiable, uh, then the loss L can bank propagate to Z directly. And then you know um, the optimization can be very uh, easy because we can make use of an existing gradient based on optimizer out of box. Uh, there is another way to approach this problem. So uh, we can learn the mapping uh, with some decoder. So um, we can you know first uh, use C to generate a lot of um, X. Uh, and uh, use that generate images as a training pair, we can learn the mapping. Okay. So uh, we want to learn the encoder, which is essentially the inverse of G. And then uh, we can learn that by mi minimizing uh, this kind of loads. So the first turn uh, corresponds to uh, the uh, latent space. So uh, it, so essentially what the coder does, because you know, uh, when you translate bank, it should be you know, close to the latent code. That's exactly what we want. We have an ad additional loss for con uh, cycle consistency. So um, as we know, because E uh, is supposed to be the inverse of G, then you know, if I apply uh, E uh, with a G together, and then uh, I should get bank uh, the input itself bank. So this uh, provides a uh, further sufficient. So by mi minimizing this, we can uh, learn a, a network um, to do the uh, embedding for us. So um, yeah, the, this is a kind of uh, interesting that we wa want to find the link that correspond to, to images, but then, um, to, uh, it actually has something to do with uh, you know, images synthesis. Um, it's a kind of a really special case of, of the image synthesis, which uh, uh, might sound useless. Uh, we actually want to generate the images uh, given that images. So uh, um, it's kind of um, uh, doesn't make a lot of sense because uh, you know, we already have the images why we want to synthesize that again. But it turns out we can you know, change that a little bit uh, and still use the same framework. So we can uh, imagine there is an unknown images, we know something about it. Well, we can specify some kind of a condition on it, like uh, you know, the kind of condition might be, uh, I want the 
images has a special pa uh, pair of eyes. And then, you know, we, we don't know the full detail of the images, but we can still compute some loss based on that. And then, you know, we can use the same loss function to guide us um, to uh, use the same embedding algorithm again to find the living code. So concretely, um, if we lo look at here, you know, all we have to do is that with this uh, new condition, I just change the loss function here uh, for the optimization based method and the code based method. All I have to do is just replace the, this uh, new loss function and then I uh, use the same algorithm, I can get out the latent code for me. And now, you know, um, this embedding algorithm essentially is the Oracle for us. So uh, now all I have to do just uh, specify some kind of condition there, and then I can make use of an uh, embedding algorithm, which can uh, uh, minimize that kind of a partial loss. And then I, I can get the latent code bank, and then I can uh, just use the generator to decode the latent code to get the images that I want. So next up, I'm gonna talk about how I can apply this and embedding algorithm. So the first um, application, uh, it's a uh, similar to what Jay has talking about. Uh, it, it's a uh, um, given a low resolution input, uh, one to find is a um, high re resolution version. So now you know that partial loss can be uh, you know we just. Uh, put the loss on the down sample version of generated images and compare that with uh, uh, that low resolution version. So the second application would be the image completion. So um, we're given a kind of a part of the images and we want to recover the rest of it. So then we can, again, uh, put them partial loss. And now uh, we just focus on the you know, no part, which is uh, the given part. And we put loss on that and then use um, uh, the same framework to get latent code to help us to recover the rest of the piece. Uh, in the third applications, we want to do uh, exemplar based image editing. Uh, you know, we are given some exemplar face paths. And we want to, uh, like here, you know, we given some uh, some someone's mouth, someone's nose, someone's eyes, someone's face. We want to generate actually a face that actually similar to each part. And we can, you know, again, um, formulate a um, kind of a partial loss for that. All we have to do is just to um, compute the generated images uh, on each face part and compare that with um, um, re references images. Right, and, and we can, you know, easily extend that. So we have a multiple face part, all we have to do is just sum up the loss. Uh, it's a uh, seems seem to be really uh, seems simple, but actually, if you're thinking about in the old way, uh, you have to you know uh, put those input as the uh, additional input to the network. Then you know now you have a variable number of input, and that uh, could be really hard if you uh, using the old paradigm one for the um, kind of a conditional image synthesis. Okay, now I uh, I want to show some result for. Uh, Super resolutions. So as you can see, you know, um, our modules has kind of a multimodality. Um, we can, you know, uh, generate the, the same, uh, uh, given the same low resolution input, we can generate a, a diverse of results. And uh, the uh, uh, also applies to the image completion tasks. And we also have some results for the example based image editing. So uh, here for each row, uh, one face path is, is different. You know, uh, for the first and second, the nose is different. For the uh, second, third, the eyes are different. Uh, for, for the third and fourth, the mouth is different. And for the fourth and sixth, uh, the face is different. And we can see that uh, generated faces are actually change accordingly. And also, uh, uh, also has some kind of a multimodality. You know, we are given the same set of a face file, we can generate several different faces. So, um, so here, um, yeah, to summarize, uh, we can kind of uh, first visualize the latent uh, space, and then we propose a unified framework for conditional image synthesis, and then we apply them uh, on three conditional image synthesis tasks. 
So, um, um, so far, uh, we, we are talking about the success story, but actually uh, the thing, uh, uh, latent space has some certain limitation. So the uh, latent space of a style game is somehow li limited by the training data. So um, here uh, we kind of uh, try to uh, embedding uh, some new faces that are not, not in the training set. Uh, I, I use my faces and try to embed that. Well, it does some, something, but uh, it's not so good. And then I also try to embed, you know, some uh, totally out of distribution images like a landscape. And you, uh, it's kind of funny that you can see it capture the color texture, but then it still uh, try to uh, synthesize the face as you can see, uh, you know, outline of face here. Um, so it kind of means that, um, you know, it's kind of overfit to the training data set, uh, even for the powerful style game. So uh, you, you cannot, you know, embed every image to that. So, you know, uh, if you want to perform conditional image synthesis, uh, you also have that limitation. And also our kind of uh, optimization based method and the encoder based method has a certain trade off. Um, optimization based method uh, has a uh, uh, slower running time, but then actually perform better quality. On the other hand, a coder based method the, um, is faster, uh, but it uh, has a lower quality. Um, and then uh, as you can imagine, uh, you can come up with a solution that lies uh, somewhere in between. Um, you can you know, uh, use the encoder output as an initialization and run number of uh, optimization uh, as you want. So, so that's all my uh, presentation. Great, thank yeah. you. So thanks again for a wonderful presentation. Um, let's go ahead and open the floor to questions from the audience. And again, feel free to unmute yourself or type your questions in the chat. So I guess my question, Shenghao, is how do you, so you mostly study, right, this um, looking at faces, right? Um, so can you, can you think of uh, other applications where something, you know, of this could be useful, um, other types of domains? I, I think uh, uh, the ability to generate new faces uh, is actually uh, useful. Like uh, if, if you want to some a vendor for yourself on the internet, you might want to generate such faces for you. Or uh, and for other uh, application, you uh, do want some uh, real faces, but you do not want you know that taken from the real person because uh, that kind of uh, uh, has some privacy issue. So then you you can you know uh, generate a new face for you. Uh, with uh, this kind of um, embedding algorithms. Great, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Hi, um, I actually had a quick question. Um, can you guys hear me? Uh, yes, yeah. go ahead. Yep. Yeah, no, very, very interesting talk. I, re I really like the results. Um, I just had a really quick question about the embedding algorithms because um, uh, have you kind of explored like what types of forms of the embedding algorithms are possible? Because right now I think you kind of showed how um, you can have like like images like I guess like like of the nose or the. But in order to come up with like a, a to be able to control that genesis, um, the synthesis of like types of images that you want, if there are like what, what exactly does the form of that embedding algorithm have to be? I guess like is my question. Um. So yeah, so that embedding algorithm, um, actually I have uh, additional slides uh, which uh, details uh, of the <laughs> uh, algorithm, uh, which I yeah, think I don't have time to show, but thanks for asking that question uh, so I can show that additional slide. Uh, so for that, um, you know, um, so like uh, what we have uh, now that um, um, the structure of the latent spaces is actually important to constrain ourselves to that. Um, 
example of the optimization based method, uh, we can simply just um, um, kind of um, uh, so for all. all Sorry, I, I think think uh, my Zoom is having some issue. Uh, can you still hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a little bit choppy. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, it's kind of a phrase for me. Uh, yeah. A. Sorry. Uh, hello. Can. You... Yes. Um, yeah, so yeah. I think in the interest of time, um, if I can ask. Um, KJ, if you can contact Shanghao um, for the specifics so that this way. Sure, that, that'd be fine. Okay. Um, Shanghao, I think you're back. Do you want to just take a minute to answer KJ's question? I don't know if he hears me. Okay, so I guess um, it seems like we're having some technical, technical difficulties there. So um, let's go ahead and move on uh, to our next speaker, which is June. June, do you want to go ahead and, you know, while June sits up, uh, we're going to give Shanghao another round of applause, even though he might not be able to hear it, um, but hopefully he'll hear it in the recording. So June, whenever you're ready, go ahead and uh, share your screen. So can you see my screen now? Uh, it's still loading for me on my end. There it is. Okay, perfect. Okay, so. Um, our next speaker is June Wang, and he thesis topic is uh, model-based robust semantic cementation. So June, whenever you're ready, uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So my name is June Wang. Uh, the topic today is model-based robust semantic segmentation. My advisors are Professor George Papas and Professor Ahmed Hassani. So first of all, let me introduce the outline of today's presentation. First, I'm going to introduce the objective of the physics and then talk about the methodology being used throughout the process and show you some results of our model and come with some conclusion and some future development. Uh, let me first introduce the objective of the physics. The topic we are trying to do with is semantic segmentation, which is actually trying to assign label to every pixel in an image. The motivation comes from the fact that we find out the segmentation model has significant performance drop under natural relation condition. Our current works mainly focus on image classification problems and several works focus on semantic segmentation. They're working on perturbation based attacks, which are usually norm bounded. So our goal is trying to enhance the robustness of semantic segmentation model under natural relation condition. So before we move on, I would like to emphasize the difference between perturbation and natural relation. So perturbation usually means adding some pixel level changes to the image without changing the appearance of the image. While natural variation, we believe is more common in real world condition, for example, like for strong brightness or for some strong contrast or extreme weather conditions, where we can see on the right-hand side, the appearance of the image has been greatly changed due to the natural variation effect. So what we are trying to do in this physics, we are trying to enhance so that our model can generate some high accuracy output under this kind of natural variation condition. Then I'm going to talk about the methodology being used in this physics. First of all, for all the semantic segmentation objective, this is similar to most of this machine learning problem, which is trying to minimize the loss function incurred by the model output compared to the uh, ground truth label. So what we are trying to do in this physics, we try to adapt to natural variation effect by introducing a natural variation model here denoted as Vx delta. So we can see here, there is an inner maximization. The inner maximization is uh, using the fact that we hope to make our model be robust to different level of natural variation effect. So we, in this case, during training time, we use the maximization to find out the maximized loss. Here we believe this maximized loss is the case with the worst case scenario of natural variation effect. And the outer minimization is still similar to the uh, original uh, machine learning problem, which is trying to find out the optimal weights of the model. So in this physics, we have two different kinds of natural variation effect. The first one is brightness. The second one is no condition. And we have two different kinds of natural variation model. The first one is what we call no model, but this case, is provided by computer vision library OpenCV. 
In this case, we believe that we have explicit control to different level of natural variation, meaning that we can change parameter to change different levels of natural variation within a function of computer vision library. But the second case is more like a real world condition where we do not know the transformation pattern from the source to target domain. We have to learn from data. Here we use a encoder decoder based network unit, which is actually unsupervised domain adaptation techniques. The assumption of, the te of this techniques is that in latent space, we have some domain invariant content code, which we may uh, construct the stru overall structure of this image. And we have some style code, which means that uh, there are some uh, specified to this image in this domain. So in here, the image, we can see that the left-hand side is the brightness condition. The middle part we can see is a source domain image with a relatively bright condition. And we can use either no model, which is provided by computer vision library, or the model learning from data. In here, we use the Munich model to transform the image from source domain to a simulated target domain. And the right-hand side is the image in, with the snow condition. Middle part, we see we have no snow effect here, but we can use Munich model to transform the image with some snow effect applied. But here, notice that because for the snow condition, uh, it is not trivial to apply a snow condition with no model, which will require extremely more extra computation resources. So here, we do not use the no model for a uh, snow condition. And then I'm going to first introduce the model based robust training algorithm. So uh, what we have here, we have images from both domains, both source and target domains, but we just have the label for source domain images. And we have our segmentation backbone, which is called PSP network. It's an industrial level uh, segmentation network. And we have our natural variation model described earlier. So what we are trying to do, we try to train our model with the simulated worst case scenario of natural variation effect by finding the maximized loss in order to generate some high accuracy output under abnormal inference conditions. So first of all, like the PSP network is actually industrial level uh, segmentation network uh, uh, using ResNet as a backbone and use a period pooling module to capture both local and global structure of the image. So actually in normal cases, this network has relatively good performance. And let me introduce the pipeline of the robust training algorithm. So uh, for the case where we have to learn the model from data, uh, natural variation model from data, we first have unpaired image from both source domain and target domain to train our natural variation model. And then during the robust training algorithm main pipeline, we feed our source domain image into the natural variation model and get our simulated target domain image. And using the robust training algorithm, we are trying to find a maximized loss inferred by this natural variation image to optimize our segmentation architecture. So the second algorithm I'm going to introduce is model-based robust adaptive training algorithm. Before we move on, I would like to introduce a concept called semantic meaning invariance, which means the labels remain unchanged under any natural variation. So here we can see two images. They are actually same image, but with different brightness condition. But we can see that no matter what kind of brightness condition or any other natural variation uh, effect we apply to this image, you can see that the car re remains to be a car. The traffic light remains to be a traffic light, which means that no matter what, we, what kind of changes we make on the image side, on the label side, because semantic segmentation is trying to assign label to every pixel in the image, so the label value will not change. So the car value will not change due to the naturation effect. And our second algorithm is based on this concept. So what is new in this algorithm is that we are trying to minimize the gap on both image and label side. On the image side, we are trying to minimize the perceptual gap by applying the model-based robust training algorithm proposed before. Because we find out that the model-based robust training algorithm is trying to use a natural variation model to transform an image to a simulated target domain. So we can actually have something like simulated target domain image to train our segmentation model. And here we believe that we are trying to minimize the perceptual gap. And on the label side, we are trying to minimize the gap of the output feature map generated by natural variation image and target domain image using GAN. So before I move to the pipeline, 
I would like to uh, introduce, introduce the uh, formulation of this adaptive training algorithm. So the first formula here is actually the model-based robust training algorithm, where we can see that the inner maximization is trying to find the worst case scenario of natural variation, while the outer minimization is trying to optimize the whole model. And what we are doing here is we introduce the effect of the target domain image by applying a discriminator to force the image in the generated by, from the target domain image to look like something we have from this natural variation image. Let's see a pipeline to be more clear. So in the middle part is the model-based robust training algorithm where we feed our uh, source domain image into a pre-trained natural variation model and use our robust training algorithm to find the maximized loss, which represent the worst case scenario of natural variation. And then we fit into our segmentation network. Here we use the PSV network to generate a natural variation feature map. But here we also introduce a target domain image into the whole uh, loop because we generate, we feed the target domain image into the same segmentation network to generate the target feature map. But here we know that because we do not have the ground truth flavor of target domain image, we cannot directly optimize our model using the target domain feature map. So what we are trying to do is that we apply another dis discriminator here for the natural variation feature map and target domain feature map to minimize the gap between each other. But at the end of the day, what we can get is that we can force the target feature map to generate something looks like the natural variation feature map. So um, let me introduce some uh, results uh, from these two algorithms. So first of all, like the data set we are using is the city state data set. And the first natural variation, what we mentioned before is the brightness condition. So in this case, we are trained an image in a relatively bright condition, but test them using a dark condition. Well, actually this is very normal for almost uh, most of the data sets in this segmentation field, because uh, most of the data set are taking image from relatively, for example, daytime and sunny weather, which is a relatively normal condition. But in real life condition, we know that um, if we are going to face some condition uh, in nighttime or extreme weather, so that will cause a great significant performance drop. Let me, let's us uh, see some numbers to pr prove my sayings here. We can see that the leftmost is the condition where we have our bright image to train the PSP network and test it using some dark image. And we can see that all the performance are lower than all other methods being proposed. And the middle four are the state of the art from the past three years are domain adaptation fields. So we can see that domain adaptation skills can somehow improve the robustness of the semantic segmentation under different kinds of natural variation condition. But again, here also find out that our proposed model-based robust adaptive training algorithm has better performance compared to all this related work and even better performance compared to the case where we actually have the label for the uh, target domain. And the left, the rightmost column here is the no model. So here we believe that if we have explicit control to the natural variation, meaning that we know what we are doing with, we know how the natural variation effect is going to uh, change our image, then we have the best performance overall. And here are some um, qualitative uh, image output generated by different models. So we can see that the middle top image is the case that we train some image in bright condition, but test them with the dark condition. We can see that due to the effect of natural variation, the output feature is really a mess and it cannot generate something useful from the model. So we believe that our model here uh, generates something relatively more robust to this natural variation effect uh, changed by the brightness of the image. And it can have a relatively good uh, performance even compared to the ground truth label. And the second one is the extreme weather condition. So extreme weather, we use no condition here, also on the cityscape data set, where we train images on the source domain without any snow condition, but we test them using some um, snow conditions image here. So uh, we, have all, we can also see that our methods are also have better performance compared to all the related work, as well as we can also see that the case, if we do not apply any domain adaptation skills or any robust training algorithm to the uh, model, the original PSP net, which originally was the industrial level high performance model, 
we still uh, face a relatively significant performance drop due to the natural variation effect. So here we can see that uh, there are also some output generated here. So say similarly uh, to the brightness condition, for the snow condition, the original PSP network, if we do not apply any image, any domain adaptation skills or robust training algorithm, the output feature map will be complete mass with not much uh, useful information being captured. While our proposed methods can have relatively high uh, prediction level. And in this case, because our, due to our computational limitation, we just have a very small GPU. So all these images are only trained a relatively small image size. And we believe that if we can scale up to a relatively high, uh, highest resolution image, we can even have better performance than right now. So let's come to some conclusion of the, this presentation. So first of all, we adapt the robust training algorithm that was originally proposed in the field of image classification into semantic segmentation. And then we further improve the performance of the model by minimizing the gap on both image and label size. So finally, we managed to achieve higher performance compared to the state of our works. So, and finally, I'm gonna talk about some future development in this field. So first of all, I have to admit that our current model is highly dependent on natural variation model, which means that if the natural variation model cannot capture a good uh, if chain transformation from source domain and target domain, our methods cannot perform as well as other methods. But, and also we can find out the case that because our model is relatively complicated, it's really far away from the case of real time uh, with high inference speed. But actually right now, all the real time segmentation model have to sacrifice in some senses of the accuracy. But what we are trying to emphasize today is that because in real world cases, accuracy usually means safety problem, which means if you create something not so accurate, you will cause a lot of problem when you deploy something to real life. So, and also we, in this case, our model have to have some target domain image as a prerequisite so that means our model still does not have the ability to be self-adapted or can self-adapt to a different kind of natural variation model. And for the reason that our model is currently combining all like different kinds of methods together, so our model is relatively complicated and requires a huge amount of computation resources. So we have, in the future, we may uh, focus on something like more lightweight to make our model more robust and with higher inference speed. And that's all for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So once again, I'm going to open the floor for questions. And feel free to unmute yourself or type your questions in the chat. So June, do you have a sense of how you could potentially speed up uh, this process? Sorry, my do you have, you know, do you have any idea, you know, do you have any thoughts on how you can potentially speed up your framework? So actually what we are doing right now is that uh, for the reason that currently our model, our segmentation model is based on um, like a very complicated um, segmentation model. So there are three, three methods we can make our model train faster. First one is that we can use some um, relatively um, not so complicated segmentation model to lower the computation requirements for the model that's on the segmentation side on a domain adaptation skill because I have mentioned earlier because we our model is highly dependent on natural variation model which means that if we apply some a more state-of-the-art natural variation model which can better capture uh, our the net effects transform from source domain to target domain we will need lesser uh, iterations to reach to optimal level. Great, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, so thank again, let's thank June again for his presentation. And I am going to ask, I believe it is uh, Nicole, if I remember correctly, let me just have to check that. Yep, Nicole is our next speaker. So Nicole, go ahead and share your uh, screen. 
Maybe we're ready. Okay, perfect. So, um, you can see my screen? Yep. Okay. So, um, our next speaker is Nicole Cho, and she's going to talk about cross domain transfer learning with auxiliary task selection for cardiac arrhythmia classification. Nicole, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Hi everyone, my name is Nicole Cho and I'm here today to present my master's thesis work on cross-domain transfer learning with auxiliary task selection for cardiac arrhythmia classification. I would like to thank my co-advisors Rahul Mangaram and Eric Eaton and my close collaborator Cook Jing for their guidance. The work presented in this thesis is a step towards improving cardiac arrhythmia discrimination in implantable cardioverter defibrillators or ICDs. Current algorithms used to solve this problem rely on parameter settings that are fine-tuned for specific patient needs. However, this process requires manual intervention by clinicians through routine checkups. While current ICD algorithms can achieve good performance for certain patient subpopulations, robust performance relies on the device's parameter settings, which may still be suboptimal even after tuning. Furthermore, Guidelines and nominal parameter settings established through clinical trials may result in poor performance for excluded unobserved populations. This highlights a key issue in current approaches since parametric algorithms lack the ability to generalize to unseen patient populations and individualized parameter tuning is unscalable. The main focus of this thesis is to develop learning-based methods to make cardiac arrhythmia discrimination algorithms more generalizable. However, one limitation is the lack of high quality labeled electrogram or EGM data necessary to train such models. This reduces neural networks ability to generalize to unseen patient signals when the algorithm is deployed. Transfer learning where a model is de developed for a source task and is reused as a starting point for a model on a second task has been shown to achieve good performance on limited data in the target domain. I chose to use abundant electrocardiogram or ECG data for the source domain because ECG and EGM signals are related by the electrical activity of the heart. However, these data were class imbalanced, thus limiting the source model's ability to learn general transferable representations for downstream knowledge transfer. Multitask learning is an approach commonly used to improve generalization by learning multiple tasks in parallel and in the process, learning a shared representation common to all tasks, including underrepresented classes. In this thesis, I aim to adapt transfer learning and multitask learning techniques to train neural networks that learn better from hierarchical class imbalance data and can be used for cross-domain knowledge transfer. The key result of this work is a cross-domain transfer approach with auxiliary task selection criterion. Transfer is done in two stages, first pre-training on abundant data from the source domain, and then fine tuning on limited data from a target domain. The auxiliary task selection criterion combines class and balance measures with domain specific hierarchical knowledge in an effort to select auxiliary tasks that improve generalization on both the source and target domains. This approach achieves a 10% accuracy improvement and a 23.5% recall, recall improvement for specific sub populations when compared to current ICD algorithms. In addition, the average magnitude of recall improvement for the parametric approach to the neural approach for patients in this subpopulation was 41.9%, indicating that neural methods can greatly improve performance on some populations that underperform with parametric methods. Finally, the thesis shows that neural networks can be trained on real population data rather than relying on clinical trial guidelines to achieve good generalization performance. In the remainder of today's talk, I will first take a step back and motivate this work in a larger context of ICD discrimination. I will then present some related work and the necessary background to understand the problem addressed by this thesis. Next, I will discuss some experimental results and I will conclude with some comments about practical implications and future work. Cardiac arrhythmias are an abnormality of the heart's electrical system that manifests in the form of an irregular heart rhythm, and tachycardia is an elevated heart rate above the normal resting rate. There are two main types of tachycardia, 
categorized by the location of the irregular electrical activity. Supraventricular tachycardia, or SVT, is a fast heart rate in the atria, and ventricular tachycardia, or VT, is a fast heart rate in the ventricles. In the case of SVT, episodes tend to be unpleasant rather than life-threatening, and most of the time are resolved without treatment. However, VTs can be life-threatening because they prevent the heart from circulating blood throughout the body and therefore require immediate treatment. Implantable cardioverter defibrillators are medical devices that monitor a patient's heart rhythm, detect irregularities in the rhythm, and intervene by applying a high energy shock when therapy is required. Furthermore, inappropriate device delivered therapy activations are harmful therapy activations delivered during a non-VT event and are typically caused by the misclassification of non-VT events as VT events. These inappropriate therapies can increase the risk of mortality in patients. Therefore, the classification of cardiac arrhythmias is an essential component in the algorithms that control ICDs. The ICD algorithm simulated in the study as a baseline for comparison against neural methods is the Boston Scientific algorithm used in modern programmable ICD devices. The input into this algorithm includes a two-channel electrogram, one from the right ventricle and the other from the right atrium. This algorithm consists of two main components, sensing and detection. First, the sensing portion of the algorithm determines the current cardiac cycle length by measuring the peaks between cardiac contractions. Then, the detection portion of the algorithm utilizes these measured intervals to discriminate between VT and non-VT events. The detection pipeline implements a series of rule-based discriminators to either apply or inhibit therapy. Finally, a decision is made by the algorithm, and it is the classification of the current heart rhythm as a VT episode, in which case therapy is applied, or a non-VT episode, in which case therapy is inhibited. Sensing consists of the amplification, filtering, and rectification of the input signal and a dynamically adjusted threshold to detect peaks that represent cardiac contractions. The duration between peaks or the cardiac cycle is measured by the sensing algorithm to be used later in the discrimination pipeline. One of the main challenges faced by the sensing pipeline is the oversensing of non-primary peaks due to the algorithm sensitivity to the filtering method or preset parameters. The figure shows the same original signal with two different filtering methods, where the method used on the top leads to oversense events as indicated by the red vertical lines. The detection pipeline takes the intervals me measured um, between peaks of the sensing algorithm and uses rule-based discriminators to determine whether VT is present. The Boston Scientific Algorithm simulated has a two-zone configuration, meaning that it differentiates between VT and an even faster and more dangerous rhythm, ventricular fibrillation, or VF. Each of these zones has its own rate threshold used to categorize the current rhythm. If eight of the 10 most recent ventricular intervals are faster than the set ventricular rate threshold, the evaluation of the current rhythm through the rest of the discrimination pipeline is initiated. However, if this condition is not met, therapy will not be applied. The previous slide discusses the current parametric approach to ICD discrimination. Data-driven cardiac arrhythmia classification has also been explored in several potential solutions, and these ex approaches exist in the literature. Recent work utilizes a 1D convolutional neural network to automatically extract features from ECG signals rather than requiring significant pre-processing such as Fourier or wavelet transforms. However, this differs from the problem of EGM classification because the available labeled ECG data is abundant, whereas EGM data is limited. I will now discuss the parametric baseline performance that was established for the evaluated EGM data set. The EGM data set used in the study consists of labeled bivariate time series data where the input feature space has two electrogram channels. The output label space is a binary scalar equal to one if the sample is a VT episode and zero if the sample is not a VT episode. 
The Boston Scientific Parametric Algorithm consists of tunable detection parameters that map the input feature space to the output label space. Bayesian optimization, or Bayes-Op, is a gradient-free optimization method typically used to optimize objective functions that are difficult or expensive to evaluate. Three parameters were included in the search space for Bayes-Op and were optimized over the entire patient population included in the data set. These parameters were chosen because the Boston Scientific Detection Pipeline relies heavily on rate-based information from the signals, as the main portion of the algorithm makes a decision solely based on these parameters, as shown on the diagram to the right. The optimized parameters show that the VT threshold became more flexible, allowing the optimized algorithm to maximize the recall performance by permitting slower ventricular rate episodes to trigger the start of a VT duration. This allowed these slow VT episodes to be evaluated by the rest of the decision-making pipeline for the application of therapy, whereas with the default parameters, they would have been ignored by the algorithm. Bayesopt improved the performance of the parametric algorithm across the general population, increasing the accuracy and recall while maintaining the precision. However, both the optimized and default parametric algorithms underperformed on patients with VT ventricular rates that were slower than the VT threshold because a VT duration was never started during detection, yielding poor recall for these slow VT patients as their VT episodes were ignored by the algorithm. Vision optimization improved the slow VT subpopulation recall by relaxing the VT threshold, reducing the number of VT episodes that went undetected by the algorithm. Nonetheless, the practical implications of the parametric algorithm's failure to detect life-threatening VT episodes for this patient subpopulation are deleterious, where the failure to detect just one VT episode can lead to severe consequences for the patient and or death. Next, I will discuss how the EGM classification problem is framed as a cross-domain transfer problem and introduce the proposed auxiliary task selection criterion. The previous slides introduced the general problem addressed by this thesis, binary classification of EGM signals. However, the data available in this domain is limited, making it difficult to achieve generalization to the patient subpopulations excluded from the training set. This motivates the use of knowledge transfer to fine tune learned representations from the, an abundant but related ECG data set with the goal of improving performance and generalizability on the target EGM data set. The source feature space consists of 12 channel ECG signals, and the label space is equivalent to a K hot encoding vector for the K possible ECG rhythm classes of the source domain, since the ECG classification problem is a multi label, multi class classification problem. The target feature and label spaces remain the same as the formulation for the parametric approach. During pre training on the source task, a source objective is optimized, which includes the primary task as well as auxiliary tasks added by the selection criterion. Then a base model is transplanted and fine tuned on the target domain using a target objective. The key challenge of this cross domain transfer problem is the hierarchical class and balance source data that makes learning general representations difficult. The proposed approach is to add auxiliary tasks into the source objective to aid in the learning of transferable representations. Each added auxiliary task is a relabeling of the feature vector label pairs, such that the auxiliary label is equal to the logical or of all class labels including, included in the auxiliary node. These auxiliary tasks are greedily chosen according to a criterion. The auxiliary task selection criterion proposed by this thesis aims to minimize the effects of class imbalance, maximize the representation of underrepresented classes in the data set, and incorporate hierarchical class information. Altogether, this criterion selects low entropy auxiliary nodes with few positive samples where the set of possible auxiliary nodes is constrained by a cardiologist defined class hierarchy. Here, low entropy indicates high label imbalance within the auxiliary node, and the entropy contribution of each class is weighted by the number of positive examples in that class to prioritize underrepresented classes. 
The class hierarchy used in this study was annotated by cardiologists using domain knowledge and reflects the decision-making process by which clinicians diagnose VT. The hierarchical structure is displayed in the figure where the red numbers enumerate the auxiliary nodes. A neural baseline was established by training a 1D CNN on the target EGM task with randomly initialized weights. This model matches the optimized parametric baseline established earlier, achieving an accuracy of around 90%. More notably, this network achieves improved recall on the slow VT subpopulation compared to the optimized parametric algorithm by 10.7%, indicating that neural methods can greatly improve the performance on subpopulations that underperform with parametric methods. This is because they are not limited by a fixed rate threshold that determines whether the episode will be evaluated by the rest of the discriminators or not. Over the general population, using the proposed selection criterion as opposed to randomly selected auxiliary tasks in the pre-training step recovers the post-transfer performance lost from the negative transfer effects of the latter method when compared to an ECG pre-trained model without auxiliary tasks. This indicates that utilizing a proposed method of auxiliary task selection provides performance benefits over choosing auxiliary tasks in an unprincipled manner. Over the slow VT subpopulation, the post-transfer results show some indication that performance on the target task improves when using a principled method of auxiliary task selection. This is shown by a 3% increase in average recall for the subpopulation with no degradation in recall for the general population. In conclusion, this thesis combines transfer learning and multitask learning techniques to develop a two-stage cross-domain transfer learning method for the discrimination between VT and non-VT in electrogram signals. It proposes an auxiliary task selection criterion to aid in learning transferable representations from hierarchical class imbalance ECG data. This work demonstrated that neural approaches have the potential to improve performance on patients whose needs are not met by the parametric clinical trial guidelines while ensuring safety for the remaining population. Additionally, the experimental results show that utilizing a principled method of auxiliary task selection achieves significantly better performance on the target domain compared to the incorporation of randomly selected auxiliary tasks. This thesis motivates avenues for future research and the personalization of these neural networks for specific subpopulations. Additionally, the cross-domain transfer method does not directly optimize the target objective during the pre-training step, and this may lead to learned representations that do not benefit the target task. To remedy this, future work could in introduce a method of learning from both source and target domain simultaneously using a shared objective that combines the use of auxiliary tasks for the source domain in a multitask learning environment. Thank you for listening. Great, thank you, Nicole. So at this time, I'm gonna invite the audience to ask questions. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself or type your questions in the chat. So Nicole, um, I think I like this idea of this personalization, right? And so um, do you have any sort of thought in that regard? Um, I, I know the fact that this is, you know, we're looking at sort of subpopulations, but do mm -hmm. you think that there's an advantage, you know, the, that it could be possible that, you know, these, you could potentially um, personalize these learning strategies for individuals as well? Right. So I talked about one specific subpopulation that benefited from learning based approaches, but there was also one that did not benefit quite as much and in fact degraded compared to parametric methods. And so one way that personalization could utilize these like rate based subpopulations is to include kind of like a measure of their normal heart rhythm in addition to their input signal. And that would be one way of um, personalizing the algorithms. Great. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Okay, thanks. Let's thank Nicole again. Thank you. And I am going to ask uh, Zhang Shong to um, get set up and share.
your screen. Okay, excellent. So our next speaker, let me just make sure I have my screen set up properly. Okay, great. So our next speaker is Zhang Shong Kai, and his thesis is on Deep Hypothesis Testing Network for Monocular Time to Collision Prediction with Front End Spatial Temporal Transformation. So uh, Zhang Shong, whenever you're ready, go ahead and begin. So, yeah, great. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Zhang Shong Kai. So I'm here to present my master's thesis on deep hypothesis testing network for molecular time to collision prediction with front end spatial temporal uh, transformation. So uh, first, I want to thank uh, my advisor, uh, Sigrid Taylor, for his support and guidance. And to the best of our knowledge, um, uh, we are the first one to approach molecular time to collision prediction problem using hypothesis testing. Uh, benefit from that, uh, what we are proposing is a very tiny and efficient network. Uh, this is like, in, in terms of the number of parameters, we successfully shrink down the network size uh, by 20 times compared to the uh, unit-like encoder-decoder network used in uh, model depth. Um, so without uh, compromising uh, accuracy or other evasion matrix. So let's get started with the uh, problem definition. Uh, the problem is to, uh, the, the goal for this uh, CTS is to predict the time to collision, pre uh, time to collision value from two consecutive input frames uh, with no sampling interval. So for the main uh, experiment data set, KT, uh, the two neighboring frames is going to be sampled with 0 0.1 second interval. Uh, so here we show some uh, example sample image. So that will be the uh, previous, image, uh, previous frame, and that will be the current frame we want to uh, predict the time to collision on. Uh, in addition to that, we uh, also assume uh, forward-only motion. So this basically means that the vehicle uh, will not turn. Uh, it's going to uh, go straight forward in a straight line. Uh, the reason for accepting this assumption is first, uh, it dramatically reduced the uh, problem complexity so that we can employ a, a much uh, faster network uh, for uh, online robotics application. And the next is that uh, if we accept this assumption and this problem will be a well posed problem. Uh, by well posed here, I mean uh, this problem is solvable without additional input or uh, assuming any prior knowledge. So the problem is uh, solvable with only these two uh, input frames and the known, uh, the sampling interval uh, set. So uh, this is uh, what I mean by the well posed problem. So here is the relationship between, <coughs> excuse me. The, uh, <coughs> This is the uh, relationship between time to collision values and uh, the collaborated pixel coordinate. Uh, yeah. So the P0 here is the collaborated pixel coordinate on the first frame, and the P1 is the collaborated pixel coordinate on the second frame. So here we can see the time to collision value and the collaborated pixel coordinate are inverse correlated with each other, and it doesn't depend on like. Uh, vehicle velocity or any um, other uh, sensing measurements. <clears throat> okay, so the main uh, motivation for this CTS is to uh, avoid feature matching to speed up the uh, time to collision prediction uh, pipeline. So uh, with this uh, equation, uh, previous work employs a common way to first establish the pixel correspondence and then uh, solve for the TTC values here. So put it into an example uh, for the green pixels uh, on the first frame, uh, previous method, uh, the, the common way to uh, do time to collision prediction is to first find out uh, which pixel is corresponding to the green pixel. So in this case, uh, that will be the red pixel on the second frame. And once we know this correspondence, we basically know P1 and P0, and then we can plug into the equation and solve for TDCs. Okay, everything sounds 
good now, but uh, this approach will have a major problem with uh, the matching complexity. But in order to establish the uh, correspondence between the green pixel and the red pixel, uh, we have to come for, for the green pixel, we have to compare it with uh, every possible uh, pixel values uh, and pat uh, surrounding patches on the second frame. So uh, in order to do that, basically we need to compare with the blue box and then the uh, orange box and every other single possible one. So we are talking about the matching complexity uh, equals to n squared, where n is the uh, image dimension. So usually uh, for like 600 uh, pixel by 300 pixel uh, input dimension, we're talking about uh, somewhere around 100 thousand uh, additional uh, matching complexity. So that's a significant uh, latency issue and that will result in a network uh, size issue as well. So yeah, the problem then goes to uh, how do we avoid the uh, feature matching then? So here we propose a uh, very interesting uh, way to do it. So the uh, our proposal method is based on hypothesis generation. So basically first uh, with the same equation uh, with these two input images, we first take a random guess of the uh, time to collision value. So just pick a random number. And uh, then we compute the corresponding uh, pixel coordinate on the second frame for each pixel on the uh, first frame. So uh, put it into an example. That is, we compute the corresponding pixel location for the uh, on the second frame for this green pixel. And if uh, our white guess is correct, that is, if our guess uh, time to collision value is close to ground truth, the expected location will be uh, somewhere around the correct uh, appearance, which is the red box here. Uh, if our uh, white guess is like a little bit off, it's going to end up with some, at somewhere else, which is the uh, blue box here. So once we know like all this uh, pixel correspondence uh, uh, with respect to the input uh, TTC uh, per presumed TTC value, uh, we can walk the original input images into a new cost volumes by simply uh, doing a uh, uh, mean aggregation on the uh, first image and the expected location of the second image, which is shown in this equation here. So uh, this yield a uh, very interesting observation here. Uh, the, the direct observation here is um, the objects are uh, sharpest when the hypothesis uh, presumed the time to collision value is correct. Um, so putting in an exam uh, example, uh, as we shown on the right here, uh, let's focus on the red uh, car. For the red car, we can see that if the hypothesis time to collision uh, is very far away from the branches, uh, it has like this blurry image uh, as it goes closer and closer to the ground truth it gets sharper and sharper and for the uh, white car behind uh, it reached the sharpest uh, at uh, three uh, approximately three seconds uh, this is like uh, expected as it's like more far with uh, compared to the uh, red car it's going to have a larger time to collision value so with this uh, observation, we transfer the uh, time to collision regression problem into a hypothesis testing problem. Uh, and then this uh, hypothesis testing can be done by uh, estimating the image blurness to put it into words. So uh, that leads to the second stage of uh, our proposed pipeline. Uh, the second stage of the proposed pipeline is to uh, so for uh, for for the input uh, color image we first go through the uh, spatial temporal transformation uh, I have described before, and then this end up with uh, uh, warp the spatial temporal cross volumes. So this is a k channel uh, cross volumes, and each channel in the cross volumes is the generated uh, blurry images. Uh, we, which we uh, we have seen uh, on the previous slides, and uh, the the goal for this uh, hypothesis multi-stream hypothesis testing network is to uh, do the image blurness estimation. 
So the way to do it is first we take a slide uh, from the case hypothesis testing network, uh, and then we aggregate with the uh, original uh, reference color image. So uh, this is to test the case hypothesis, and for the case stream, this is going to output a, a, a confidence map. And uh, after the softmax, uh, the final output will be the uh, probability of the hypothesis stands. So then uh, after we uh, get the, prob uh, the probability, we uh, obtain the final uh, prediction time to collision value by aggregating all the uh, probability with its presumed uh, time to collision value for each string. So uh, this is the, the wide guess uh, time to collision value we have uh, set before. Okay, so by shallow signal network, uh, what I mean here is uh, um, this uh, network architecture, which is super uh, tiny and efficient. It basically uh, consists of uh, two convolution and one max pooling, uh, another convolution and max pooling, and uh, the third block of that, and then last convolution. So uh, this network uh, reception field is strictly uh, controlled uh, as restricted to uh, 78 by 78 pixels uh, on an input image size of 60, uh, 640 by 192. So uh, the, the idea behind this is to restrict the uh, reception field so that the network will not overfit to a global spatial location and it can only inference using a local uh, feature uh, information. Okay, so uh, the, the goal for this uh, synthesis is to predict the time to collision value, but time to collision value is uh, kind of hard to visualize when uh, to get an intuitive idea of uh, how good our system is working. So here we adopt a result of visualization value projection. So this is the uh, time to collision value we have predicted uh, uh, for our system. And then we assume that it's a static environment uh, without any uh, moving object so that we can multiply the time to collision by the vehicle uh, forward velocity to recover the uh, prediction depths. And once we have the prediction depths, we can do a reprojection uh, for the, first, the second uh, frame to the first frame so that we are uh, synthesizing an image at the uh, first, the post of the first frame uh, using the uh, predicted time to collision or predicted depth from the second frame. So ideally, um, if the predicted time to collision is uh, perfect, the synthesized image is going to be exactly the same as the first reference image. So as is shown here, so uh, the, uh, last three rows is showing the synthesized uh, image for visualization purpose. And uh, uh, if it's a perfect prediction, uh, the synthesized image should be exactly the same with the uh, first row here. So as we can see here, uh, the baseline uh, monodepth V2 encoder decoder network uh, uh, always have this twisting effect when facing uh, structuralized uh, patterns such as uh, the house, house buildings here. And uh, compared to that, our approach has a significant uh, better uh, prediction value here. So uh, we our, our prediction value is both consistent. Uh, as you can see, it's still a, a building uh, structuralized uh, pattern here. And uh, it, it's also uh, like way more accurate than the, uh, previous, uh, the, the baseline method. So the same uh, phenomenon is uh, the same uh, result is also observed uh, on this uh, set of uh, different environment. So for example, for the stop sign here, uh, the uh, baseline method always have this uh, twisting effect so that the uh, sign is no longer a straight line. So uh, we, we also uh, show some uh, quant quantitative uh, result. Uh, so the quantitative result is shown in this figure uh, where uh, for our method, uh, K stands for number of hypotheses used. 
So usually we use 16 uh, hypothesis and uh, the hypothesis testing ranges is uh, from 0 0.1 as the smallest one and uh, 8.0 as the biggest one. For everything uh, bigger than 8.0 because it's not an imminent thread. So we basically uh, click, uh, click the value there. So uh, there are two uh, interesting observation here, uh, interesting result here. The first one is that we are surprised to find out from the first row of the result. Uh, the uh, baseline method actually show an unexpected good performance on single input image frame. So predicting time to creation from single image frame is um, by principle not uh, and well post problem. It's a, it's a ill post. You, you you can't even know like whether you are moving or you are standing still. So it's not supposed to work, but somehow the uh, baseline method achieved uh, an accuracy uh, more than 90%. Uh, well, this is unexpected. And the reason for that uh, is uh, because KD dataset is a relative small dataset and it is featuring uh, auto timing scenario. So uh, for some reason, the baseline method uh, find a way to overfit that dataset and uh, achieve a significant uh, a good accuracy here, but this is uh, like uh, a limitation for the data set here. So nevertheless, um, uh, our method achieved better performance uh, in terms of the uh, log RNCE and uh, loop projection uh, SSIM and loop projection L1 norms here. Uh, with the accuracy metrics, uh, we have like a slight 2% decrease, but considering that our network is 20 times smaller than the baseline method, so it's an acceptable, and we hope that this um, this trade off between uh, network size uh, would be helpful uh, for ver uh, various underlying applications. Yeah. So the conclusion uh, for for the thesis is uh, first we proposed a two stage uh, approach for time to collision predictions with molecular cameras. So the first step is to do hypothesis generation with a front and spatial temporal transformation. Uh, the second step is to do hypothesis testing using a multi-stream uh, shadow scene network, which is 20 times smaller than the uh, previous uh, baselines. So uh, with that in mind, we successfully transferred the time to collision uh, regression problems into an image blurness estimation problem uh, where like human, even human like with naked eyes, you can tell the time to collision from the cost volumes. And uh, the final result is our, uh, with this uh, tiny and efficient network, we achieve a kind of similar or better performance uh, compared to the uh, baseline method. And we hope that this uh, super efficient network could potentially benefit future uh, real-time robotics applications. Yeah, that is all for the presentation. Um, feel free to ask any question. Thank you. Um, <coughs> thank John Shao for his presentation. And at this point, I am going to invite the audience uh, to ask questions. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself or um, you know, take your questions in the chat. Okay. Uh, I guess I'm gonna I'm going to just uh, uh, jump in and first uh, a great presentation, John Song. Uh, uh, really enjoyed. I wonder if you would care to comment on um, uh, training of this network and how you went about it, and are there any uh, uh, things you learned about it? Yeah, great. It's a good question. Uh, so the training is actually a little bit tricky. Uh, tricky here. Uh, let me get here. Uh, I ignore the detail because uh, due to the time constraint. So basically, uh, we are training a multi-stream uh, network architecture. So here, as we mentioned before, it's uh, 16 um, hypothesis uh, generated for that. So we are talking about a 60 frame, a 60 stream uh, 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 convolution neural network. Although like our um, network size is significantly smaller by 20 times, but for training, uh, we need to like, like train the 16 stream uh, jointly in an end-to-end -end fashion. And what we observe in practice is that uh, the training actually is uh, very painful and slow here. Uh, the reason for that is because uh, usually like after one or two epochs, the uh, 
the network uh, converged to several streams. So basically out of the 16 streams, only like one or two is pr uh, producing a significant confidence and the others are like close to zero. And the problem is uh, when we are doing the reading back propagation, uh, the uh, training, uh, the basically only one or two streams are actually learning. The others are basically uh, doing this computation with uh, zero gradients. So uh, the way we, we we kind of improved our training schema by uh, doing a patch based uh, uh, training first. So basically, we uh, we, we don't train train on the full cost volumes uh, at the first day at the first step. Uh, we instead to randomly select uh, four uh, channels from each uh, build cost volumes for each pixels and uh, for for each uh, seventy eight by seventy eight patches, and we feed it into uh, a, a one stream uh, network. It, we kind of train it in a one stream fashion uh, so that the network can be uh, trained more efficiently. Uh, when, once we have the network trained in uh, like patch based, in, in this patch based fashion, uh, we have a good initialization and then we do uh, two or three epochs of uh, fine tuning with this uh, joint to join uh, training on all 16 streams. Yeah. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? So let's uh, thank John Shong again. And I am going to ask Brandon, who's our next speaker, to get set up, please. Okay, I will go ahead and share my screen. Great. Okay. Can everyone hear, um, see my screen and hear me okay? Yep. So let me just do a quick intro. So our next speaker is Brandon Gonzalez, and his thesis is on exploring the development of novel sensor systems for human occupancy detection. So Brandon, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brandon. And uh, for my thesis today, I will be talking about the development of uh, sensor systems, hybrid sensor systems for human occupancy detection. And my advisors are Dr. CJ Taylor and Dr. Madhu Anapragata, uh, both of whom I would like to thank for all the discussions and, and help over the past year, which helped make this thesis uh, possible. So I will go ahead and get started. So general overview of, how, of what I'll be talking about today. Uh, so I'll kind of give an introduction of the problem that this thesis tries to tackle. And then I will talk about a bit of background research. So understanding the different kinds of sensors that we're working with, as well as uh, some papers that discuss the problem of human occupancy detection um, that were helpful for this thesis. Then I'll talk about the experimental design. In the lab, I'll talk about the system that I used and how it was designed. And then I will talk about the, an analysis of the results that we got, and then a conclusion to kind of wrap things up. So first thing we'll get into is the introduction. So what exactly is human occupancy detection and, and why is it useful? So occupancy detection, it's any kind of system that can autonomously detect someone in the vicinity. So you don't need someone to actively be monitoring, monitoring the system to detect someone. It just automatically detects on its own and reports that there's someone in the vicinity. Uh, so depending on the kind of, on the application of the system that we want, uh, the, the sensor system could only detect some kind of motion and not necessarily track a target, it just detects whether someone enters the vicinity or not. Um, while others may actually actively track a target and give a count of the specific number of people in the vicinity. And we'll talk about sensors that are useful for uh, one type of, uh, motion detection and then others that are useful for uh, target tracking specifically. And the kinds of applications of occupancy de detection are really endless. Um, so building automation, uh, this is something that you see if you walk into a CVS and, and you see that the doors open automatically. Uh, anything that sort of automates the, the system um, in a building, it can, you can use human occupancy detection for that. You can use it for safety precautions. Um, so in some kind, of, some kind of industrial environment, if you want to sort of make sure that a system turns off if a human is in the vicinity, uh, then occupancy detection is useful for that. As well as autonomous navigation. So say for robotics, um, being able to, uh, to sense whether there's a human in, in the vicinity um, 
autonomous cars come to mind, uh, being able to, to detect a human in the vicinity. Um, for this thesis, it's kind of, it kind of focuses a little bit more on, on the idea of building automation, but you can apply the, this technology to all sorts of different fields. So now that we have an understanding of, of what human occupancy detection is, let's think about some of the challenges uh, in this field. So occupancy detection systems require the use of a sensor, uh, at least one kind of sensor, or some combination of sensors. So sensor design, uh, when, you're, when you're trying to pick out a sensor or you're designing sensor, it's usually a balance of, of several different things. So accuracy, uh, how consistent is the device in detecting humans? Uh, how often is it given false positives um, and triggering when there's no one that, uh, when there's no one actually there? Uh, as well as how often is it missing people in the scene? Uh, power, so power consumption, how much energy is the device consuming? Uh, both when it's inactive um, and both when it's actively sensing someone in the environment. And the cost. So how expensive is, is the device to, to manufacture um, and to, to purchase and integrate into your system? Uh, because that's going to affect how you can scale the device, uh, how you can scale the system and use it in different, lots of different environments. So the goal of this thesis is to try and design a hybrid sensor system that is comparable to vision. And we use vision as a baseline, um, specifically using computer vision algorithms. We're trying to design a hybrid sensor system that combines different kinds of sensors to produce results that are comparable to, to computer vision. So with kind of the, the introduction in mind, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the background research for this thesis. So. What we'll start with is the different kinds of sensors for occupancy detection that we explored in this thesis. So there's a wide variety of sensors that utilize the electromagnetic spectrum to detect humans. Uh, so perhaps the most common is vision, uh, which a lot of the other projects in this, uh, in our presentations today have explored computer vision. Um, so very popular and powerful tool to use. Uh, audio. So detecting whether there's someone in the vicinity based on the sound uh, that they might make. Ultrasonic sensors, uh, which you, essentially they send out a ping and then they receive some kind of reflection and you can tell if someone is in the vicinity based on that reflection. Uh, infrared, infrared sensors, which look at the heat signature of the, of the environment and detect whether someone is present based on uh, if they see an, an alteration in that heat signature and millimeter wave, um, which also send out reflection, uh, send out pulses and then look for reflections based on whether there's someone in the environment. Um, and of course, there, there are lots of other different kinds of sensors that you can use, but these are just a few that come to mind. And, uh, and for this thesis, we, we pick a subset of these, of these sensors to explore. So in the next few slides, we'll discuss a few, a few of the sensors that we use specifically for this thesis. So the first that we're going to talk about is the optical camera. So the one, uh, the sensor that, that utilizes vision and essentially captures an image uh, on a light sensitive surface. So again, the, these kinds of sensors are ubiquitous in our world. We see them everywhere from personal phones to uh, surveillance camera systems. Uh, you, you'll see them anywhere that you go. And there are lots of different computer vision algorithms that you can use uh, on the, the images that are captured from these kinds of sensors. Uh, but there are concerns over the power consumption, uh, specifically if you want high resolution images, it might consume a lot of power. And at the end of uh, talking about these sensors, we'll, we'll have a table that kind of summarizes the different, uh, the different kinds of sensors and we'll compare their power consumption, uh, as well as privacy. So trying to preserve the anonymity of someone in the scene, uh, if you have a, an optical camera, uh, you might have trouble doing that and that might not be desirable for people in the environment. Uh, they might not want to have their face captured, right? So for this thesis specifically, we use the ArduCam as a baseline. Um, so here's, here's an image. It's a nice small camera that mounted um, onto, on, in the environment, in the lab environment. Um, so it was pretty useful to use. And it was relatively cheap, um, comparable to the, to the other sensors that we use for this project. Um, so that's the optical camera. The next I will talk about is passive infrared, or also known as PIR sensors. So they essentially look for differences in the infrared heat signature of an environment to detect some kind of motion uh, based on a human entering the environment. Uh, 
So the PIR sensor needs some time to initialize uh, to baseline heat signature in the environment. Um, and then once it has sort of a reading of the environment without anyone in it, then it's able to detect changes based on motion in the scene. So if someone enters the environment, it will detect that the change in that heat signature. And it will be able to say, hey, someone is in the environment. And these can come as pretty low powered uh, devices. They'll, um, some of them, they'll only consume uh, microamps of, of current, um, which compared to the other kinds of sensors uh, is pretty good. But they can't track someone, they can't really track someone or distinguish between multiple targets in the scene. They can only detect some general motion, but you can't really use them to efficiently detect and distinguish between multiple targets in the scene. Um, so that's kind of a, a pitfall of these sorts of sensors. And so for this piece specifically, we use the HCSR501 um, for the hybrid sensor system. Uh, we explored a few different kinds of PIR sensors, but I found this one to be useful because you could toggle with sensitivity and its time um, and have sort of more precision over uh, how you're going to detect someone in the scene. Uh, so this, the, this is the kind of PIR sensor that I ended up using. The next kind of sensor is infrared cameras. Um, so these also utilize the infrared spectrum, um, but these use a, what's called a thermal pile array to convert thermal, uh, thermal energy to electrical energy. And that electrical energy is a signal that we can read. And so these kinds of, uh, these kinds of sensors, they'll, use, they'll yield a pixel by pixel map of an environment's heat signature, uh, which is more useful than in the PIR sensor, it just has an output pin that goes high or low based on whether there's someone in the scene. This is actually yielding a pixel by pixel map, uh, which is more information for us. Uh, still not as, not quite as high quality a, a resolution as an optical camera. The ArduCam was a, uh, it's a 1080p camera, uh, which is pretty good quality. This, this, the camera, the infrared camera that I ended up using was only eight by eight pixel. Uh, which is not that high quality, but still more useful than PIR. Uh, and specifically for target tracking, you can, you can actually sort of detect the, the, uh, uh, a blob in the scene. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we went about doing that using um, image segmentation. But the specific infrared camera that we use for this project is the AMG8833, also known as the GridEye uh, from SparkFun. And so this, it communicates its data over an I squared C bus um, to a microcontroller. So this is a uh, more, more useful than a PIR sensor to use. And the last kind of sensor that we'll talk about is millimeter wave. So this uh, certainly the most, uh, the most complicated of the sensors that, that we use here, but uh, this uses a, a radio frequency antenna system, which transmits energy. So it sends out a pulse and it receives reflections um, across the millimeter wave spectrum. So it's pretty robust. It's not really as, um, it's not affected by environmental conditions such as lighting compared to other sensors. And it can even pass through different materials. Um, so it's, it can be pretty useful for detecting humans specifically. And the kind of sensors that we use specifically was the IWR6843 from Texas Instruments um, or TI. And so it's not only uh, the, the IWR, it's not only a radio frequency antenna, uh, it's also integrated with an on-chip microcontroller from ARM and a digital signal processing chip from TI. Um, so it has a lot on, on, the, on the package and it transmits point cloud data, um, which is what it detects from humans in the scene over USB. And so this is the, the system. You can see the antenna is here and the, the USB port to transmit data um, is here. Um, so this is, uh, it can be a very useful tool. And so just a kind of quick comparison of the different kinds of sensors that we talked about um, in terms of their output. So uh, the kind of resolution that we're getting as well as the uh, medium through which it transmits the signal, uh, the amount of power that it consumes. Um, so again, you can see this is the uh, uh, microamps, whereas these use milliamps. Um, so PIR is definitely the most power efficient, um, but perhaps the least accurate or helpful uh, for human detection and the cost. Um, so one thing to know is that the millimeter wave sensor is expensive, um, at least the one that we ended up using. Um, so that's kind of a pitfall, millimeter, millimeter wave sensors compared to something like a PIR sensor, which you can get for very cheap. Um, so this is just kind of a broad overview of the different kinds of sensors that we use for this project. 
And in terms of just past research in the area, so one, one paper specifically, uh, 2019 paper on novel occupancy detection um, using low power IR FPA based wireless occupancy sensor. It, this paper I found particularly helpful to kind of guide the design of the system for this thesis. It used a different uh, wide variety of, of sensors, um, some of which we didn't use with, for this thesis, uh, but like PIR, ambient light, long wave infrared. And one idea that I liked in this paper was that they had different tiers of sensors. So the first tier of sensors uh, were always active and looking for some kind of motion in the environment. And then once that tier detected something, it triggered the second tier, which then gave a more refined kind of view of the scene. And then uh, otherwise, the second tier was just kind of asleep. So this idea is going to show up a little bit later in, in the experimental design of the system. So with that said, we'll get into the experimental design of the uh, hybrid sensor system. So in terms of the experimental layout where we did the, the experiments for the system, we used the fourth floor of the grass lab, uh, which has a nice open space for the sensors to detect uh, someone. And the devices were mounted onto a pillar in the center. Of the room. So this is just a, a photo of the, of the lab space. And you can see a nice open space um, where you can walk in front of the sensors and it, it'll be able to, to detect you. And on this pillar, the, these are the, the devices here. So the camera we use as a, as a baseline to compare our, our hybrid sensor system to. Uh, we used our, our DoCam, uh, which can interface with microcontrollers, but we use it to stream data over USB to MATLAB. And within MATLAB, uh, you, from the computer vision toolbox, we use a uh, function called the Cascade Object detect Detector, which used the Viola Jones algorithm to detect and label uh, upper bodies that it, it, it saw within the frame. Um, I decided on using upper bodies because that was, it, it can detect different parts of the body, but um, I found upper body to be the most helpful because that was the part uh, that was most present within the frame, uh, within the camera frame. And here's just an example of me standing in the lab and being labeled by the, the camera system. Um, so what's important to know is that the camera baseline is separate from the hybrid sensor system we're using as a comparison. Um, so the results from the camera system, they won't be used in the hybrid sensor system. The hybrid sensor system is a combination of the other sensors that we use. Uh, so we use an Atmega 328P microcontroller to interface with the PIR sensor and the uh, IR camera. And that 328P sent its data over USB to the computer. Uh, and then the millimeter wave also sent its data over USB. Uh, millimeter wave has its own microcontroller on the board, so there was no need to interface with the 328P. It could just go directly to the, to the laptop. And once the laptop had the data streams uh, over the two USB ports, it processed that data in MATLAB and then determined whether there was someone in the scene based on the data that it was seeing. So this is where the, the idea from the paper earlier kind of comes into play, where uh, we use the PIR sensor as kind of the first tier, uh, which is just used to detect some kind of motion in the scene. And then once it detects some motion, it triggers the IR camera. Uh, and then once the IR camera sees someone sees some steady um, person detection, then it triggers the millimeter wave sensor uh, to try and track the person in the scene. And so this uh, is more efficient to use uh, a tiered system rather than having all the devices just constantly on, um, especially because the millimeter wave and the IR cameras consume a lot more power um, of, uh, for the system. So here's just a general overview of the, of the uh, system architecture. Again, noting that the Ardu cam is not a part of the hybrid sensor system, it's just kind of uses baseline to compare. And so just a general overview of the, the idea of how the IR camera detected targets. So it produces a heat map and we can use image segment, segmentation on this heat map. So we inter, interpolate the, the image to a 32 by 32 pixels. And then we use we turn this into a binary image using a threshold value. So we turn it into an image of ones and zeros rather than temperature values. And then we run a com connected components algorithm on this image to essentially group together pixels into blobs. Um, so adjacent pixels are grouped together into blobs. And so this is, a, this is just what the grid eye reports. And then we turn that into a binary image so that we can extract the blobs from, uh, from the image. For the millimeter wave sensor, uh, we use a signal processing algorithm on the front end data that's coming from the antenna. Uh, and that algorithm includes a fast Fourier transform. Um, and it removes false detections in the scene and, and static fluttering in the scene. And then it groups together those points, uh, 
the point cloud data that we see so that it can label and track a target within the range. And so we see uh, this is an example of what it outputs um, the point cloud and the, uh, the gating and association of those clouds into targets. So with that in mind, uh, we'll just do a, a, a quick analysis of the results. Um, so essentially using an evaluation, uh, evaluation method that I found from Texas Instruments, um, essentially we, we look at three metrics, the good measurement rate. So the percentage of measurements that didn't have errors um, where we take a measurement ever, every 0.5 milliseconds uh, for 10 seconds. And across all the measurements, we, take, we look at a ratio of all the individuals that are missed. Um, so how many of the, the systems did not pick up as well as a ratio of the false positives. So how many it falsely reported that were present in the scene. And we tested three different scenarios. So one with an individual walking into the scene and just standing still in front of the, uh, in front of the system. Another with an individual walking into the scene and moving around in the scene instead of just standing still, seeing if it can still detect the human. And then another where the individual walks into the scene and then exits the scene to make sure that it's not uh, producing false positives. So for the camera baseline, this is just a summary of the different results across the trials that we saw. And one thing that I noticed for the camera baseline is that the, the vision algorithm began to struggle when the target was consistently moving or came too close to the camera. It started to, to fail to recognize the human in the scene. Uh, lighting in the lab may have been an issue for the camera so that um, because it's an optical camera that might have been an issue. And the algorithm was also triggering on environmental cues, including there was actually a humanoid robot in the background that sometimes it would detect falsely. So you could, I can imagine you could refine the vision algorithm to deal with motion better and try and uh, remove those, those false cues in the background. So the hybrid sensor system, it, I noticed that it struggled to detect when the target was motionless as the millimeter wave tries to remove static clutter. So that might be a problem if the, if the target is standing still, it might end up removing that target from the scene. But it does a good job of tracking the target when they kept moving compared to the camera, it's able to track the target more efficiently. Now the IR camera is, does a good job of detecting stationary targets because it just looks for the heat signature and that heat signature if the human is standing still, it's still going to be present. The millimeter wave detects target in motion pretty well. So perhaps I could work on optimizing the system better on, and trying to combine, combine the, the strengths of these two sensors uh, to detect targets both in motion and standing still more efficiently. So in conclusion, uh, some possible improvements. It, the hybrid sensor system was able to detect people um, similar to the camera system, but perhaps we could use better sensors. Another IR camera for, um, to provide us uh, depth in the scene could be useful or higher resolution. Um, so going higher than just eight by eight pixels could help with tracking. Better integration of the system. So instead of using a microcontroller feeding into a PC, um, one idea could be use a Raspberry Pi and feeding the IR, um, the millimeter wave sensor and the PIR sensor, the IR cam uh, camera all into the Pi camera. I'm sorry, the Raspberry Pi for computation on the system. And perhaps using a better algorithm, um, perhaps using common filtering or some other advanced algorithm to get more efficient results and combinations of, the, of all the sensor data. So looking forward, um, as discussed at the start, the applications of these kinds of, of detection, system, um, detection sensor systems are endless. Uh, this project was originally just um, inspired by discussions with Dr. Taylor, Dr. Ana Pragada, and Michael Wong and Deo Adewale of InstaHub uh, for the purpose of automatic lighting control systems. Uh, but it could also be useful, say, in the, in the pandemic era of social distancing to make sure that you're keeping track of the number of occupants in the scene. Uh, and these are just a few of many examples. And so I hope that my work has helped provide some insight into the technology and tools available in this field. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Brandon. So um, in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to invite the audience to, um, if you have a quick, short question, to please go ahead and ask. And then I'm going to ask Brandon to stop sharing and ask Adarsh to start setting up for his presentation. Questions? So a quick question, Brandon. Um, yeah. It must have been somewhat awkward doing these kinds of testing when you're the only person in the lab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Finding lab space—it was kind of um, a little tricky to just because of the 
the pandemic added another kind of layer to, to the project. But fortunately, we were able to, to get the lab space and um, especially in the spring, we were able to test. Um, so that's one thing I, I wish I could have tested with other people in the environment, try and see how the system works with multiple people. But hopefully that's something that in the future um, uh, we, we could try and look into. Okay. Darsh, go ahead and share your screen. I was going to say it probably wasn't a bad thing to have the whole bunch of backgrounds being, you know, behaving like, you know, pretending to be a human. <laughs> Thank you. So thank, let's thank Brandon once again. Thank you so much. And so for our, our last but not least speaker of the day, uh, Adarj Kulkarni and his uh, thesis is on deep learning of footstep planning for legged robots on unstructured terrain. Adarj, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Thank you so much. Yeah, so uh, as Ani said, uh, my name is Adarj. We're gonna be talking a little bit more about uh, footstep planning for legged robots using some learning. Uh, my advisor for this effort is Dr. CJ Taylor, so big thanks to him. Uh, and her Songvi has been a great collaborator throughout this process, so big thanks to him as well. Uh, to start, a quick outline of what we're going to talk through, uh, a little bit of motivation and overview, a little bit of related work on, on what, what's, what's already been done, a uh, bit of an overview on quadrupeds, specifically the Vision 60, which is the target platform for this, a bit about the simulation data pipeline, and then finally some of our actual learning experiments of our terrain autoencoder, learn for dynamics models, uh, some nonlinear optimization that's then used to supervise a learned model, and some conclusion and future work. Quick disclosure, uh, a lot of people already know this, but just in the spirit of transparency, I do work at Ghost Robotics. So uh, using the Vision 60 kind of makes a lot of sense uh, for me. And using the Vision 60 simulator, having written the whole thing also makes a lot of sense. So just if it seems like it's really narrow towards that, that's sort of the reason, uh, just, just in the spirit of transparency. Uh, so a little bit on the motivation, why does this matter? Uh, legged robots are really physically capable. It's just the software tends to, to limit what they're able to do. Uh, and so we've got these really great blind reactive gates that offer a ton of mobility, but they really shine in their sort of gate specific workspace. And what I mean by that is whenever we have any kind of gate, we have sort of a max step, we have certain parameters that define how well this robot can walk over different trains. And they're really fantastic at what they do. The, the interesting part comes in when, let's say, we come across some special situation where we want to use more of the legs workspace that isn't necessarily in the gates workspace. So for example, if we want to do that, uh, stuff like that is pretty difficult today. Um, and and they're, they're, they're very segmented, being able to walk over on structured terrain like what's above and being able to sort of say like climb onto a boulder like what's below. Uh, and so the idea here is not to replace the blind gates, but instead to augment them uh, in a way that makes sense, that allows us to get the best of both worlds and really climb over all sorts of unstructured trains, but also maintain this reactive agility. A little bit more motivation. Uh, this is a, an example of a much older robot, but this is just a blind gate uh, operating on this big old rock pile. Uh, you can see that there is there is some stability to be had here. Uh, and not to take anything away from the blind gate, it's great that it even works a little bit, uh, but you could imagine like right there, some footstep planning would have helped. And the fact that this video cuts off in a second here before the second rock pile, you know, uh, uh, not, that, that didn't go so well. Uh, so, so clearly footstep planning is a, is a thing we want and a, and a thing we want to work on as an augmentation. So an overview of what we do in our system is we start out with a simulation. That's really the key to everything. Uh, and with that simulation, we train a terrain autoencoder. We'll talk more about that later. And we train a forward uh, terrain aware dynamics model. Using both of these two things, we're actually able to bootstrap and supervise a actual footstep planning network that not only uses what those two models know, but also is able to uh, leverage what Tower, a nonlinear uh, optimization system that's open source that we use, uh, also is able to figure out. And we, our goal is to feed forward that back into the simulation. You know, we're in the pandemic era, all of this was done in simulation, uh, but we try our best to limit the sim to real gap as much as possible and make design decisions based on that. So to talk a little bit about related work, there's really two categories I wanna talk about. The first is optimization based footstep planning. Uh, there's really a ton we could talk about here. I'm going to try and stick to a couple of salient concepts. The first one is the idea of offline nonlinear optimization. So this is the idea of where you've got some crazy hopscotch type terrain in front of us. We're going to stand behind it, look at it, map it out, solve some crazy terrain, take a literal minute or a literal two minutes, solve it, and then just execute that. There's no replanning in the process. Uh, so that, that's one approach that has shown success. Uh, and an and, and extension of that is to make that a bi-resolution optimization. So first we solve a whole body trajectory. So what's the center of mass of the robot as we go through this terrain? Uh, and then we use that to help constrain the toe optimization. Uh, because generally, you know, if we try to optimize both at once without any kind of constraint, the combinatorial complexity explodes really quickly. 
And finally, not strictly optimization based, but worth mentioning is the search based footstep planning system. So this is, you know, our A stars or slightly more fancy versions of A stars that are able to sort of iteratively manufacture a, 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 a trajectory that makes sense. Now, it's got all the same uh, pros and cons of any search based system, but worth noting. The second category is learning based footstep planning systems. Um, again, here there's a ton we could talk about. I'm going to try to stick to a couple of interesting examples and interesting concepts. The first one, uh, is, is a little similar to some of the things we try to do in this effort, uh, which is they also use Tower, but they try to create a learn system that gives Tower a better initial guess. And so Tower is that nonlinear optimization system. And, and you know, many of you will know that if we're doing this kind of nonlinear optimization, our initial guesses really matter for our compute time. So if we can give it a good initial guess, we can take what used to be uh, intractable to run in real time and make it a little bit more real time. Uh, so, so that's an interesting effort. There's another thought on using a privileged teacher and student architecture. The privileged teacher has access to more information or higher quality information and is used to then supervise the student. And the final idea is using different kinds of unsupervised learning to segment the navigation and the robot execution problem. Uh, this naturally has uh, sort of a ceiling to it given the inherent inter uh, interminglings of the navigation execution of a legged robot. That's sort of the whole idea here. Uh, but this paper was able to show that there are some both compute benefits and generalization benefits of still segmenting the issue. And you know, they're more agnostic to what robot they use and more agnostic to the environments they operate in. So, so still, still, still some gains there. So to talk a little bit about the quadruped platform, specifically the Vision 60. It's a 12 dot platform, three, dot, three degrees of freedom per leg. It's got an abduction hip and knee motor. Its nominal gait is this reactive diagonal trot. So you can see here, there are uh, the two opposing diagonal pairs operate together, both in flight and stance phase. We've got two main forms of input control to this gate. The first one is a run of the mill 2D command velocity. It's linear X, linear Y, and angular Z. And the second thing in tandem with that uh, command velocity is body frame target toe location. So we can say, we want to go this way at this velocity, but we also want to hit these toe locations. So we would pass down two toe locations for the toes that are currently in flight. Uh, and so this particular clip, I want to, I want to make sure we, we, we talk about it for a second. This particular clip is a perfect representation of what reactive uh, gates are good at. But you could imagine once uh, the, the sort of uh, amplitude of the noise of the unstructuredness goes above that, it starts to struggle a little bit. And that's where an augmentation with a system like this would make a lot of sense. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our actual simulator. Uh, there's some visualizations on the side. It's all in ROS2 and Gazebo 11. It's got ODE dynamics under the hood. And it's got a 1.5 kilohertz update rate. And it's fully simulating the entire blind gate and proprioception that normally runs on the real robot. This was critical for us because we want to limit the sim to real gap as much as possible. We're running the exact same system. And the idea with this visualization is that the dynamics are good enough, except for right there. I don't want to say they're perfect. They're good enough. Um, and, and so the fact that the blind stair system can run at all builds a lot of, uh, uh, of confidence in our, in our system that, hey, this is close. It's good enough. We can actually learn some stuff with this. Uh, and, and their thought there is the blind stairs algorithm is really exercising all the most difficult parts of the physics engine in the, in the simulation. So this gives us a little bit a little bit more confidence that this is actually accurate. Uh, and the whole thing is containerized. This is going to come in handy with a lot of the infrastructure that comes up in the future. But uh, this, this, this is the simulation system that we use. We've got all the perception in there as well. We've got cameras and depth cameras. Uh, and so you can see we've got 3D uh, terrain recreations. We've got laser scans. But what's most interesting uh, to pay attention to is the uh, height map that's on the left in Arvis there. That's what our key sort of terrain representation for this work is. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we use that uh, in, a, in a second. So a little bit on our data generation pipeline. Uh, we've got a system for creating random terrains and you know, they've got different random tile sizes, random heights that are sampled from some random, uh, random distribution. Uh, we've got a system for putting those into gazebo, randomly generating command velocities, running it around inside of that, uh, inside of that uh, goofy terrain, automated bagging, automated fall detection, all of this to say, there's a ton of infrastructure that was necessary to really even do our first experiment. Uh, and, and, and even though it's really engineering work, I think it's important to mention what all of it is because it is a prerequisite and it does need to happen. Uh, and, and legged robot simulation is really not entirely solved yet. You know, there's still a whole lot to be desired. You guys saw the fall at the end of it. Um, so, so really just to give context on, on where we're at there. So with that, going into the actual first piece of learning is the our first uh, uh, thing to do is a terrain autoencoder. And the re reason there is because we have a concern that the dimensionality of the terrain representation is going to drown the state information. And the reason for that is, you know, we can see here we've got 100 by 100 uh, terrain height map. That's 10,000 floats, right? The most uh, sort of verbose state estimation, a uh, state um, representation we could ever use is probably going to be like 50 or 60 floats. Uh, so there's a concern of that being drowned out. 
Uh, and so we train a convolutional and dense autoencoder. It's got 750,000 parameters. It's not that big. Uh, again, targeting that real-time embedded inference at some point. So we're, we're trying to keep that in mind. Uh, and we end up with about a 97% compression ratio, which is decent, 288. We feel a little bit better about the size of that vector. You can see at the bottom, uh, that's what the input is. The top is the output. Certainly not perfect, but it instills enough confidence uh, that, the, that the network has, in fact, summarized what the terrain looks like. This is a key ingredient for this next part, which is the terrain aware dynamics models. To talk a little bit about the inputs, we've got 12x join angles, 12 uh, joint velocities. Again, it's a 12 knot robot. We've got uh, roll pitch and yaw of the body orientation, linear x, linear y, and angular z of the velocity command. I want to talk a second, take a second to really talk through this part uh, and a four by four uh, 16 channel vector of the previous toe contact and its location in current body frame. So that's 16 total, one for each leg. And it's a uh, binary contact, 0 or 1, and x, y, and z in body frame. And what we do is the sample we're taking is likely different from the literal moment that the footstep happened. So we project those footsteps from body frame at that time to current body frame. Uh, and this allows us to have sort of a pseudo normalization. And it allows us to keep things consistent. And you know, it doesn't really matter if the robot is a kilometer away from the origin or not. You know, we don't have to deal with, with static world frames. This keeps things a little bit more simple. And of course, there's that 288 dimension encoded terrain. The output, again, very similar to that 16 channel uh, vector, except it's the next, uh, next toe contact and location. So again, whenever we create our data sets with that automated pipeline from before, we go through and we label, hey, this is where the footsteps were. This is what the uh, body, uh, body location was uh, at that time. And then we project it back to whatever uh, actual, actual sample we're, we're using at that time. The loss function we use is a contact aware L2 loss. And what I mean by that is we talked before about how the diagonal trot uh, only two uh, two uh, legs make contact at any given time. And so we don't loss on the legs that don't make contact. That wouldn't really make a ton of sense. And the reason we don't have eight outputs, only two legs, is because then the network would have to output sort of very different things at any given, uh, at alternating uh, inference times, which really is not doing it any favors. So this, this we found was sort of the optimal uh, paradigm for really being able to learn all four legs uh, and, and being able to inference in real time. The network is super simple. Four layer dense network, 74,000 parameters. Again, it's really, we're keeping an eye on uh, closing the symmetry gap, keeping an eye on, you know, using a Xavier, using an NVIDIA embedded system. That way, you know, we're not, we don't need a big old 3090 or something. Uh, uh, um, so yeah. This is a little bit of the output uh, from that terrain aware dynamics model. You can see the yellow and green is one diagonal pair. The red and blue is another diagonal pair. Uh, these pictures look much, much worse than it actually is. Uh, <laughs> so it's actually quite good at wa walking on different trains and predicting like, hey, I'm about to go onto a step and it does predict a higher step. So this is actually quite good. We are now armed with a terrain aware dynamics model that is able to predict where the feet are gonna go given a current terrain and given a current command and, and current state. That takes us to our final portion of this, which is the actual supervised uh, planning, uh, pl footstep planning network. And for that, we need to talk a little bit about Tower and its optimization. So Tower is, is, is another paper. It's an, op it's an open source optimization system for legged robots. Let's talk a little bit about the constraints they follow. Uh, they use a no slip toe constraint in stance phase. They abide by the terrain Z height so we can tell it all the terrain information. They abide by the friction cone and they abide by the different gate timings. And the objectives and outputs, we have a center of mass trajectory, right? That there's that bi resolution coming into effect again. We've got an end effector location trajectory and the contact forces whenever those end effectors are actually in contact with the train. And so in particular, I want to talk a little bit about this end effector location because it's really, really important. Uh, the thing that really sets Tower apart and makes it so generalizable is the fact that they don't care about the dynamics, or not the dynamics, but the kinematics. Uh, the dynamics is a separate thing. They do simplify that to be uh, uh, just simple lump sum dynam uh, dynamics. But um, because they don't pay attention to kinematics and they only operate in the end effector location, it's very robot agnostic. Uh, so it's very straightforward to switch out different robots. It's very straightforward to put in a new robot that you know, they haven't worked with before. Uh, and so we can see a visualization of how that sort of looks. We can tell it a nominal gate workspace or a nominal total workspace and allow it to solve from there. And we can solve the kin kinematics on the back end to actually come up with joint angles and joint pairs. So what do we do once we solve that uh, actual, uh, uh, actual optimization problem? We got a fully defined trajectory with a uh, whole body trajectory as well as end effector trajectory. We turn that into joint commands as mentioned before. And we discretize and reformulate that into actual model inputs. So the stuff we talked about before with command and, and joint angles and joint velocities and things like that. So the actual model that we train, it's structurally the same as the terrain aware dynamics. Its velocity command changes slightly. There are some nuanced shifts in, in what the different inputs and outputs mean, but they're, they're, they look very much the same. 
So the velocity command is less so this is your velocity, and it's more so this is my desired effective velocity. And the output footstep is less so if I go this velocity, where will my toe toes fall? It's more so I want to go this velocity, where should my toes fall to best, best achieve that velocity? So they look the same and they smell the same, but the nuanced meaning of them is slightly different. And the idea there is that everything that the dynamics model has learned about legged robots and the blind controller and all of this information, it's actually useful for this same sub, sub problem that's really an extension of it. Uh, and so again, uh, I'm not sure if actually you guys can see my mouse, but uh, the velocity command is much different and the, and the output is sort, of, is, sort of, is sort of what's different. So I don't want to dwell on this too much. There were some technical difficulties creating uh, visualizations to show the output. So I'm going to stick to qualitative and verbal. Uh, qualitatively, the optimized trajectory recreation does work. We do recreate what Tower was able to solve for. Uh, the issue comes in in the fact that trot gates, even though they're the same gate, have differences. And the idea there is there's a ton of parameters that define these gates. You know, there's your max step height, there's your actual speed of joint, there's your uh, apex phase, which is sort of at what point in the footstep does the toe reach the max height. There's all of these different variables that actually define what these look like. And the key insight from there is joint states are not really translatable between gates. Even if it's the same nominal gate, all of those changes make things hard to translate. And so even though we're able to recreate a trajectory, when doing inference, it really doesn't look like we want it to look. We, we see it get all confused and, and start to stumble because, because it's, not, it's not acting and behaving the way it was trained. So I want to talk a little bit really quick about this. In the interest of time, I won't really dwell on it. You know, we tried a bunch of different ablations. We tried different inputs and outputs. Some are more important than others. You know, not super surprising. Command is less important. Joint velocities and previous steps matter more. My hypothesis there actually is that the command is built into those inputs anyways, which is why this works. Uh, so we did a bunch of experiments there. And to talk a little, to conclude a little bit, I won't go through all these uh, bullets, but really uh, we have a learning capable simulation environment, which was no, no small feat. Uh, we have a quite capable terrain aware dynamics model that's enabled by a uh, 97 compression autoencoder. And we have a nonlinear optimization model that's supervised by an open source uh, a system that's able, that's bootstrapped with these learned dynamics. Uh, and so some uh, opportunities for future work, sim trivial, that's at the top of the list. Can't wait to get back into lab at some point. Uh, doing some gate tuning between tower and the blind controllers, figuring out how we can reconcile that. Maybe it isn't gate tuning, maybe it's some other form of reconciliation, but that's an important problem. Uh, perhaps there's an approach that uses recurrent networks here because we want to output not just the final footstep, but more control throughout the process. And in that same vein, maybe we output full splines instead, uh, as opposed to just output footsteps. And maybe there's a thought there. Uh, and, and finally, a 2D height map is a summarization of a 3D terrain, but it's still going to lose information. So what other alternate uh, representations can we use? Are the 3D representations can we, uh, that we can use? Uh, that, that's another open question uh, as we start to advance and, and, and the system works a little bit better. So with that, uh, hopefully that was interesting and made sense. Uh, if there's any questions, I'd love to take them. Great, thank you, Adarsh. <coughs> so at this time, I'm gonna open the floor for questions. Yeah. All right. Well, well, let me like, just jump in. Uh, I mean, uh, fantastic job, Adarsh. Uh, you know, I, I know how much, exactly how much uh, uh, effort went into all those various ph phases that you went over very, very quickly. Um, since it's sort of at the top of your list, I guess I wanted to uh, give you a chance to sort of elaborate on the uh, sim to realness, which is, uh, you know, I think in some sense a very, uh, um, in some sense you're in you're in a great position to be able to 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 think about this and that you do yeah. kind of both. You've sort of seen the robot in action as well as seeing the simulator side of it. Yeah, yeah. I, so my, the, the hierarchy of thought process there is um, we try really hard to keep the simulation as close as possible. In fact, I'll even say we don't even use simulated contact forces. We actually still use uh, proprioception, which is how uh, our robots walk in real life. Uh, and so there are efforts taken there. There are efforts taken in the idea that the 2D height map was not chosen for no reason. It's because the perception system on the robot is really good at creating that. Uh, and so there's another thought there. Uh, the, the other aspect is we keep our models as small as possible. We don't use, you know, ResNet 150 or something that's absolutely gigantic. We keep really, really small networks because on the real robot, we don't have a big old discrete GPU. We've got an EDB little Xavier, which is, you know, great for its size, but still small. Uh, and, and so we've made some efforts in keep trying to keep it as bounded as possible. The, the really biggest roadblock here uh, really comes in in the gate differences. Um, I'm quite confident that 
with a maybe 80-20 split and 80% simulated data, 20% ROS bags from the real robot, we could get a terrain aware dynamics model. We could get it to work and it would work. Uh, I'm rel pretty confident in that. What is still sort of to be seen is those gate differences, they're only going to be exacerbated in real life um, because in the sim, it's a little bit more fatalistic. The robot walks really, really well, or it just blows up, right? You, you know, this, the physics engine nans out. What happens in real life is not a nan. What happens in real life is a whole lot of uh, really sort of really dynamic reflexes and, and stumbling, uh, which, which exacerbates the problem big time. Uh, and so I, I won't pretend like I have an answer to this yet, but some really interesting things that I think we'll need to think about is what happens when that stumble happens. Because when we train these simulated things, we don't see a stumble. It, like, it's not possible because the physics engine cannot handle the dynamic complexities of a stumble. Uh, and, and, so, and so there's a lot of interesting things there. Obviously it's a positive feedback loop because if we had a good system, it wouldn't stumble. But it, so it's like, a, it's like it, it gets worse and worse and worse. But um, um, th those are some of the ideas that, that, that sort of are worth thinking about. Those are some of the, the approaches we've tried to, we've tried to um, pay attention to. Um, ho hopefully that all made sense. Great, thanks. Look forward to talking with you more about this. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. So once again, let's thank Adarsh one more time. And so let's thank all our presenters um, one more time. Congratulations to everyone for a job well done. And congratulations on, on finishing uh, the semester. So at this point, uh, we are concluding the presentation for, for our thesis, uh, for our verbal thesis for, um, the, for spring 2021. Um, good luck with the rest of uh, finish up, finishing everything up. Um, I'm going to stop the recording at this time. And uh, as Colleen 